I'm Mark Updegrove, director of the LBJ Library. Welcome to the Civil Rights Summit and what promises to be an historic conference. We've come here to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, one of many pieces of landmark civil rights laws that have transformed our country and helped us to fulfill our promise as a nation. Over the next three days, this stage will be graced by many who will shed light on the civil rights movement of the 1960s and many of the civil rights issues that we face in our nation and around the world today. Among them will be four U.S. presidents, Presidents Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Unfortunately, the fifth member of this distinguished group, President George H.W. Bush, one of the honorary co-chairs for this event, couldn't be with us today. When I saw him last weekend at a conference celebrating the 25th anniversary of his presidency, he gave me a letter and asked that I read it on his behalf. As you'll hear, it eloquently frames the importance of civil rights in our nation's history. It reads, I regret not being here for the event at the LBJ Library as we look back at a historic and vitally important time in the life of our republic. The civil rights movement brought about a great and needed change in our land so that our law and the reality of our individual lives began to more perfectly reflect the ideals embedded in the roots of our nation's founding. Circumstances have progressed through the decades, too often at great cost and at great turmoil. But looking at America today, surely our nation is closer to holding those sacred truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Sincerely, George Bush. This conference would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Throughout their histories, those organizations have made their own contributions in furthering the cause of civil rights. It is now my privilege to welcome to the stage Ed Welburn, Vice President of Global Design at General Motors, one of our title sponsors, who will offer a few words. Ed, welcome. Thank you, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, Mark, thank you for your kind words and for the invitation to help celebrate the 50th anniversary of President Johnson's signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I'm truly honored to have the opportunity to participate in the summit alongside so many great Americans who have had such a positive impact on our country. Their contributions are nothing short of extraordinary. I grew up in Philadelphia, just a kid who wanted to design really cool cars. <laughs> when I was uh, 11 years old, I wrote a letter to General Motors Design. This is a true story, by the way. I wanted to know more about automobile design, the training needed, and the schools that would help me to develop my skills. I was just 11 years old. Fortunately, GM answered my letter. It was full of great information, including the steps I needed to take for me to realize my dreams. Those steps eventually led me to the School of Fine Arts at Howard University, an internship with GM Design, ultimately employment with General Motors, and was the company's first African-American car designer. Today I stand before you as GM's Global Vice President of Design and the first African American to lead a global design organization in the auto industry. I lead over 2,500 creative people working in 10 design centers around the world. I know I am proudly standing on the shoulders of the strong leaders whose vision and tenacity helped me to make, to move to the position that I'm in today. People such as President Kennedy, Dr. Martin Luther King are among those people who had a great influence. And of course, President Johnson. Over the course of my life, 
equal access and opportunity have become something I would come to value. This combined with the values passed on to me by my mother and my father and my desire to work hard to pursue my dreams are precise, they precisely embody the spirit of the Civil Rights Act. So again, it is an honor to help us reflect and to celebrate. My search for opportunity and GM's simple gesture in responding to my letter resulted in my lifelong dedication to the company that has repeatedly showed, showed me that it is a leader in supporting people of all races, colors, sexual orientations, and backgrounds. President Johnson said on the day that the act was being signed into law, and I quote, this is a proud triumph, yet those who founded our country knew that freedom would be secure only if each generation fought to renew and enlarge its meaning. He then urged every American to join the effort to bring justice and hope to all people. In many ways, General Motors responded to that call, ensuring opportunities for those less likely to receive it during times when it was not popular or practiced. Specifically, in 1968, GM introduced the auto industry's first minority supplier program. In 1971, GM was the first Fortune 500 company to have an African-American name to its board of directors with the appointment of Reverend Leon Sullivan. In 1972, GM created the industry's first minority dealer program. These are just a few of the many GM initiatives that preceded the company's adoption of the Global Sullivan Principles of 1999. Today, we continue our dedication to inclusion and opportunities. It was probably best illustrated when Mary Barr was named CEO of General Motors earlier this year. Mary is now the first female to lead an automotive manufacturer. In addition, five of the 14 GM board members are women. We have a strong anti-discrimination policy and have offered domestic partner benefits for nearly 15 years. In the spirit of renewal and enlarging the meaning of the Civil Rights Act, we strive to cultivate the next generation of leaders and innovators by making opportunities possible where they may not have been. As board member of the General Motors Foundation, I am proud of our Buick Achievers uh, Scholarship Program. It places specific emphasis on awarding scholarships to students from all backgrounds who are or will be the first in their family to pursue a college degree. This program is just one of the numerous examples of the GM Foundation's long-term commitment and investment in our country's future. The president of the GM Foundation, Vivian Bacard, is with us here today, and I think she deserves a round of applause for what she does. All of this is business critical to GM. That is because designing, building, and selling the world's best vehicles for customers in today's competitive environment means having a staunch commitment to cultivating a diverse workforce to both understand, meet, and exceed the needs and expectations of our customers. In closing, I would like to again say that GM and the GM Foundation are honored to be here to support this occasion, and we thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for your remarks and for your support. In less than 50 years, the fight for gay rights has gone from a small uprising in Greenwich Village, New York, known as the Stonewall Rebellion, to a national movement. 
At present, the battle for same-sex marriage is being waged in courthouses across the country. The two men who brought to the U.S. Supreme Court case, a case against Proposition 8, a California ballot initiative that would have banned same-sex marriage, are a legal odd couple. Ted Olson and David Boyce had fought against each other in the U.S. Supreme Court case Bush versus Gore, which decided the outcome of the 2000 presidential election. But they joined forces on the subject of gay marriage. In our first panel today, Ted Olson and David Boyce will talk about how they came together over the issue. Moderating today's session is the editor of the Daily Beast, John Avalon. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Avalon, David Boyce, and Ted Olson. Well, it is an honor to be uh, the first panel of such an extraordinary conference um, and to have a conversation with two extraordinary gentlemen. Um, at a time when our country often seems deeply divided and polarization seems endless, these two people who fought in court at Bush v. Gore have set an example for the nation and how you can come together from a position of principle uh, to achieve real progress. Um, and so uh, I'm looking forward to a great conversation with over the next hour, Ted Olson and David Boyce. Um, first, there's no question our country, 50 years after the original Civil Rights Bill, is in the midst of a new civil rights movement surrounding gay rights, marriage equality being the, the current front of that fight. We have seen a sea change in popular opinion around this issue over the last 20 years that would have been unimaginable. My first question to you is, what parallels and what differences do you see between the current gay rights movement in the United States and the civil rights movement 50 years ago? David? Sure. Um, I, I think one of the parallels is that, like the battle for racial civil rights, for a long time people denied that this was a civil rights issue. Um, they defended it on religious grounds, on constitutional grounds, on grounds of tradition, on grounds of protecting the family. Uh, all of the ways that we have over the course of the history of our country tried to deny to one group of our citizens the equal rights that our Declaration of Independence and Constitution promises to everybody. I think one of the things that is different is how fast we have moved um, and how far we have moved so quickly. Um, less than 50 years ago, three years after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, a group of uh, activists uh, filed a petition with the Federal Civil, right, uh, Civil um, uh, Service Commission um, asking to have the ban, uh, the federal employment ban on homosexuals lifted, or at least modified. Uh, because at that time, the federal government would not hire anyone who was openly gay or lesbian for any position. You couldn't be an attorney, you couldn't be a clerk typist, you couldn't be a post postal service person. <laughs> And they asked the Civil uh, Service Commission to change that rule, and the Civil Service Commission refused. Mm -hmm. And so we've gone from a period of time in which you couldn't be employed by, the, by your own government um, because of your circumstances, and, a, and at a point where um, even uh, almost 20 years after that, it was still a crime uh, here in Texas. Um, to engage in homosexual conduct. Uh, so you've gone from a time when it was criminalized, when it was, people were barred from employment, to a point where we are on the verge of establishing true equality um, for this group of, of American citizens as we have for countless others before them. So I think that part of the parallels are how the same kind of arguments are always used to uh, discriminate, justify discrimination. But part of the thing that I think has been uh, very satisfying has been to see how fast we have moved away from that uh, once uh, this has been exposed to the light of day. Uh, I've, I've always said that part of being a good lawyer is to understand what the best arguments is 
for the other side, and I'm usually pretty good at that. <laughs> and um, even in Bush v. Gore, I could see some of the arguments. <laughs> uh, but um, this, this is a case in which um, uh, the other side doesn't have an argument. They've got a bumper sticker that says marriage is between a man and a woman. I mean, that's the, that's the question. That's not the answer. So, Ted, are there any differences between that civil rights movement 50 years ago that now seems so self-evidently moral clear and the gay civil rights movement? Or is it simply just a, a, a continuous chapter in that effort to form more perfect union? Well, I think David and I see it as a very much a part of a continuum. Um, we, the Supreme Court has said that we do not tolerate uh, putting classes of our citizens into boxes, into groups in which we could deny them equal rights and equal dignity. Um, and that's what we have done with our gay and lesbian citizens. And we're recognizing now throughout this country um, that that is a cruel, harmful discrimination to to think about um, marriage, for example, because we've been so much involved in that. The Supreme Court has said 14 times over the last 150 years that marriage is a fundamental right. It's a matter of liberty. It's a matter of privacy. It's a matter of association. It's the most important relation in life, the Supreme Court has said. So in many states, including the California case that David and I were involved in, California had drawn a line or a fence around its gay and lesbian citizens and said to them, you may not have in your relationship the most, relationship, most important relation in life. Your relationship is not as good as the relationship of heterosexual individuals to marry the person they love. Proposition 8 said marriage uh, will only be recognized uh, between a man and a woman. Uh, only those kind of marriages will be recognized or valid. So that was telling gay and lesbian citizens and everyone in California that those people are different. They're less worthy. They may not have the same relationship. Their children, 37,000 children being raised in gay households in California, are in a family that's being discriminated against. And the California Supreme Court <clears throat> called that second-class citizens. That's what we were doing to our African-American citizens. That's what, over the years, we've done to women in, in, in marriage relationships and other individuals in, in society beca because they're a part of a group that we want to put and classify as different. Uh, what David and I have been fighting for, along with many, many other people, of course, is for us to eliminate that vestige of discrimination against citizens who are just the same as the rest of us, who have the same aspirations and the same dreams. You know, you, you spoke briefly about your fight with California and Prop 8, which was successful and has uh, receded in the history books to some extent. There's a documentary being made, but now there's a new fight on, not just 40 different cases around the country, but one that you're directly involved in in Virginia. Uh, you'll be arguing that in May, I believe, in, in the circuit. Uh, the symbolism of Virginia yes. seems rich because of the Loving v. Virginia decision in 1967, which banned interracial, bans on interracial marriage. To, to what extent does that venue, that history, hang over this case? To what extent does that inspire you and, and clarify the stakes? Well, I, I think that the Loving against Virginia case in 1967, in which the Supreme Court held it was unconstitutional for a state to ban interracial marriage, was an essential part of what we were arguing. Because what the Supreme Court said in Loving is that it's not a question of interracial marriage, it's a question of marriage. Um, just as it's not a question of same-sex marriage, it's a question of marriage. It's a question of are you going to deprive any class of citizens of the right to this most fundamental relationship? And the court in Loving said a state cannot do that. And I think the symbolism of Virginia is important uh, because it was the source of loving, um, because um, it is a, a state that has one of the most um, discriminatory uh, uh, constitutional provisions uh, with respect to gay and lesbian citizens. Um, it, it goes out of its way uh, to try to denigrate um, and isolate and discriminate against gay and lesbian citizens uh, far beyond what was the case in uh, Proposition 8. And yet, at the same time, it is the home of Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry. 
Um, and so many people who have contributed so much to the principles of equality that we're all fighting for. And so I think the symbolism of trying to go to the, the home state of Jefferson uh, and Patrick Henry and, and many, many others um, that were our founders and to try to implement the principles that they articulated so eloquently more than 200 years ago in the face of this constitutional ban in the current Virginia state constitution, I think is something that we felt was not only important uh, as a, Virginia is obviously a very important state, uh, the South is obviously a very important region of the country, um, but in addition, the symbolism was something I, I think we were all drawn to. We're, we're going to be, I just want to add one more sure. thing. Very seldom can I add anything to what David <laughs> says, but we're arguing this in Richmond, Virginia, which is the home of the, the Commonwealth of Virginia, right. the home of the author of the Declaration of Independence, right. the, James Madison's home, the principal author, I think most people will agree, of the United States Constitution. Uh, we'll be at the home of, uh, in Richmond with John Marshall, uh, the leading chief justice for 34 years, uh, who stands more than anyone else for the Constitution. Um, for the citizens that we represent in Virginia, to live in the Commonwealth of Virginia and to look all around them and see those famous people and to realize that they're not yet being treated equally. Um, that constitution that David mentioned says that not only can they not marry, if they were married someplace else legally, their marriage won't be recognized in Virginia. If they enter into a domestic partnership or anything that approaches marriage, those contracts will not be recognized in Virginia. Uh, I'm a Virginian now, I have been since 1981. I feel very, very strongly, and David does too, that if we can make a difference in Virginia, uh, and maybe that will be the case that goes on to the United States Supreme Court, that will be so important for this country, um, the home of these individuals. And, and, and beyond the, the symbolism, which is so clear and inspiring, um, let's drill down on the, the, the legal theory of the case for you. I mean, this is a case, as of Loving View, Virginia, that has precedent, you've argued, uh, previously in the Supreme Court, that is really rooted in the 14th Amendment. Walk, build that historic argument based on precedent and constitutional amendment to the present day for the audience here and people watching. Well, we're talking about um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, grew out of, in large part, of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which of course grew out of the Civil War, uh, which guarantees that no state may deprive persons within that state of the right to equal protection of the laws and due process of the laws. The United States Supreme Court says, has said, as I said many, many times, that marriage is a fundamental right. Therefore, you have a right not to have that right taken away from you, that fundamental right taken away from you. That's the due process clause. And the equal protection clause guarantees what the Supreme Court has says, the right to the protection of equal laws. That's what the Supreme Court said in the 19th century. So citizens who are gay or lesbian are being denied, denied the fundamental right to marriage and they're being denied the equal protection of the laws, the protection of equal laws with respect to marriage. And that takes away their dignity, as, as Justice Kennedy has said three times now, in the Lawrence versus Texas case involving homosexual conduct, and a case called Romer versus Evans involving Colorado legislation that took away uh, protection of laws that were preventing discrimination, and in the Windsor case from last June uh, with respect to individuals under the, with respect to the Defense of Marriage Act, you're taking away the person's decency, their dignity, when you're calling them different. And so those all relate to those fundamental rights of due process of the laws, access to equal rights, access to the fundamental rights in this country. That's the gist of our constitutional argument um, and we think it is very simple, and we think that it's enormously significant that since the decisions of the United States Supreme Court last June, countless federal judges have dealt with this issue in Texas, in Oklahoma, in Colorado, the district court in Virginia, in Ohio, and I think in Michigan, maybe another state or two that I'm leaving out, every single one of those federal judges have recognized 
the rights of these constitutional rights of our gay and lesbian citizens with respect to the issue of marriage unanimously. Right. It's enormously significant. And, and David, I mean, this is really unprecedented. I mean, these are judges appointed by different presidents in different regions of the country at a time when, you know, marriage equality had lost the ballot box over and over and over when we were at a tipping point. Um, judicially, it, mm -hmm. it has been basically a clean sweep. That yeah. significance may be hard for folks to appreciate yeah. in the present tense. It, 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 it's hard even for a lawyer. Um, there are very few principles that you can get um, five or ten lawyers or judges to sort of agree with completely. Um, here you've had more than 30 federal judges who have considered the issue of gay and lesbian rights since last June. And every one of them uh, appointed by Republicans, reported, appointed by Democrats, appointed by all the last four or five presidents um, in every area of the country, um, in, the, in Texas, to Utah, to Ohio, to Oklahoma, to Michigan, north, south, east, west, uh, every political affiliation, they've all ruled the same way. Every one of them has ruled that Marriage is a constitutional right, and you cannot deprive individual citizens that, that right based on their sexual orientation. Now, that's extraordinary uh, to see something like that move that fast and with that universality. And I think what that reflects is what I said earlier, which is as a matter of principle, as a matter of legal principle, there simply is, are not two arguments. As a matter of legal principle, the due process and equal protection argument under the precedence of the United States Supreme Court make it absolutely clear that a state cannot deprive people of the right to marry. I mean, the Supreme Court has ruled in some of the cases that Ted talked about is um, uh, you'd have a state, Wisconsin, um, said that if you've abused a prior marriage and you are a child support scoff law, you can't get a marriage license for another marriage. Rational state. Um, approach. Supreme Court says that may be rational, but that's unconstitutional because marriage is such a fundamental right. The state of Missouri says um, we're not going to allow imprisoned felons to uh, marry. It's disruptive. Uh, they can't uh, be together anyway. Uh, there's no procreation possible. So we're not going to allow them to marry. Um, the United States Supreme Court says marriage is such a fundamental spiritual right. It's so inherent in the nature of the dignity and liberty and right of association and liberty that the Constitution guarantees. The state of Missouri can't do that. Um, uh, Loving, of course, says you can't uh, deprive people of the right to marry based on race. Um, uh, Lawrence against Texas um, says that people, uh, regardless of their sexual orientation, are entitled to constitutional uh, protection. Um, you put those precedents together and there aren't two ways that you can come out as a legal matter. People can have different points of view as a matter of religiosity or uh, policy or how they feel about people. But as a matter of legal theory, you can't come out two different ways on this issue. And that, I think that's what you're, you're seeing in the federal district judges that have considered this issue. And so that would lead one to say that when the Supreme Court does decide to take this up again, if they decide to take this up again, It'll be awfully hard, especially with the precedent of Doma and Windsor, to not take a stand and have this be the law. We, we believe so. The Loving versus Virginia case, at that time, uh, 16 states still prohibited interracial marriages. That's 1967. That means the president's mother and father, they tried to be moved to Virginia and be married, and that year they would have been guilty of a felony. That was a five-year prison sentence if they dared to marry someone of a different race. Now, the Supreme Court decided unanimously that that violated the Constitution. Today, most people don't believe that that could have been the case right. in, in the United States of America. Um, and attitudes changed very, very rapidly. Um, not immediately, but over time, people have changed. The same thing is happening with respect to 
according dignity to our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters. When we started this case in, two, in May of 2009, we took an average of the national polls. There was a margin of 17% difference. Most people opposed um, the right of gay and lesbian citizens to get married. There was a differential between those that uh, favored it and those that were against it of 17 points. Last June, when the Supreme Court decided the marriage cases that the court decided, the polls had changed by a margin of 25%, so there was 8% more in favor, and now it's up to 10 and 11% uh, in favor of allowing gay and lesbian citizens to marry. That's only five years. It used to be a, just a few years ago was a wedge issue in this country of political elections. Now. The, the, uh, the people that might be opposed or don't really want to make it a political issue because they will lose. Um, young people under 30, uh, it's 70 to 75 to 80 percent um, respect the rights of gay and lesbian citizens to get married. So this country is changing very, very rapidly, thank goodness, um, to respect their, their neighbors, their friends, their coworkers who are gay. And, and yet, I mean, there is, there's no question there's been the sea change, and it's been rapid, um, and, and, and perhaps unprecedented. I'd like mm -hmm. to speak to that. But in contrast to 50 years ago, it's certainly clear the legislators aren't leading on this. I mean, in, in, in the civil rights bill that Lyndon Johnson you know, passed through his great skill as a mm -hmm. legislative negotiator, it was a bipartisan coalition. Todd Purdom's book discusses you know, Everett Dirksen's key role in this, working with Hubert Humphrey. Um, if you look at the House of Representatives today, I believe only two Republicans support marriage equality, and only six support the Employment and Non-Discrimination Act. So what, what does that say about, about the current state of our politics, about the current state of legislative will, and what's gone wrong with the Republican Party? Well, remember, remember that's David Ted, will, but uh, David, 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 David can take David will speak as to the Republican Party. <laughs> well, um, without uh, <laughs> defending the Republican Party entirely, if you say something's wrong with the Republican <laughs> no, Party, right, never, never, never. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the things to remember is that the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964 um, came a decade mm -hmm. after the Supreme Court had decided Brown against Board of Education. Um, uh, I think that you didn't see the legislature um, uh, leading on this issue in uh, the 1950s uh, or the 1940s. Um, when, uh, when President Truman desegregated the armed forces, that was an act of uh, presidential leadership. Uh, it was not something that he ever could have gotten through Congress at that point in time. Um, I'm quite hopeful that you will see uh, bipartisan uh, uh, leadership in the legislature on this kind of issue as we go forward. Uh, in addition, uh, remember that um, uh, while this case was pending, uh, the legislature uh, repealed "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." Mm -hmm. um, so I think that I think that you are are seeing uh, the beginnings of uh, legislative recognition uh, on this issue. But legislative um, recognition uh, almost always is a trailing, um, a lagging indicator. A lagging indicator. Um, uh, it, it takes executive leadership, it takes judicial leadership, and to some, some extent it takes the leadership of the people um, to tell the legislatures that they're behind. And if they want to be a leader, they better get in front of the, the people. It's a reminder to all of us that you know, when we read a history, it looks all cut and dry, it looks inevitable, but we're mid-scrum, and it's complicated, right. it's difficult. Uh, Ted, particularly for you, your partnership, I think, has been such a powerful, hopeful symbol for so many people because you two have been able to come together on an issue of principle that you believe are consistent with your philosophy to move the ball forward. And, it, and it's a different kind of coalition. It's the kind of thing we don't see in Congress. And you're right, Congress has been a lagging leader mm -hmm. traditionally. Um, but, but Ted, I'm, I'm interested on your perspective from within the conservative movement. I mean, you've been from the Reagan administration, the Federalist Society, no one would choose to question your conservative credentials. Well, and that until a couple of years ago. Until a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. and that's what I've I'd, actually heard a lot of people do that recently. <laughs> and, and that's what I'd love for you to, to, to reflect on, it, is, is the pushback you've gotten from one-time allies and how you answer that. Well, um, the process is changing. Um, and I felt very, very strongly when I was approached about the possibility of representing gay and lesbian Californians. I grew up in California. 
I felt that it was wrong what was happened with Proposition 8. And I was glad to have the opportunity to do this. But I also felt that I might be very sus suspect, not just by conservatives, what, uh, what is Ted Olson doing? Um, and I don't mean to exaggerate myself here, but I mean, I knew that there was going to be some of that, and I knew that there was going to be skepticism and criticism from gay and lesbian organizations and from the, from the left, uh, what, uh, what is he up to, and so forth. And that's one of the reasons why David and I came together on this. I thought that was extremely important that we present this as not a left or right conservative or liberal issue, but it was an American constitutional issue. And that if the two of us, I felt that if the two of us who had been on opposite sides of the Bush versus Gore case, because lots of people watched that contest and watched that legal issue, and then could see, think, but gave us the opportunity not only to reflect opposite parts of the political spectrum. I won't say opposite poles because David and I are awfully close on an awful lot of issues, um, maybe more than people that realize. we differ on. Um, but that if the American people could see the two of us come together who are, we're in a way representative of opposite ends of the political spectrum and that, and that people would be curious about why we did come together and what we had to say. It would give us an opportunity to help educate the American people, help persuade the American people that this, was, this cause was just. With respect to conservatives, I felt that if I could just speak to conservatives um, and talk about the issues, among the other things uh, that we talked about, I wrote a piece that was on the cover of Newsweek. Um, in that, that, that came out uh, the same day that we started our, same week that we started our trial in San Francisco. I call it the conservative case for gay marriage. And I made the points there that I think are very fundamentally true. Gar marriage is a coming together of two individuals who love one another, who want to build a family, who want to build a relationship in a community. They want to be part of the community. They want to be part of the school system. They want to be part of the municipal government. They want to pay taxes. They want to be respected as a stable, conservative part of the community. What could be more conservative than that? And does marriage between those loving individuals damage heterosexual relationships or heterosexual marriage? Does anybody think that uh, a man and a woman are not going to get married because a gay couple gets married next door to, down the street or they're gonna refrain from having children or they're gonna, they're gonna somehow get a divorce. No, that's nonsense. As David says, it's, it's a bumper stickers. We heard a lot of bumper stickers. So yes, I did get some pushback from conservative community. Tell, um, tell me a little bit about that pushback. You know, well, I would, get, I would get some messages. I would get some people that were in, in, reported in the press of saying that I was a traitor to my principles and so forth. But I mean, if you have principles, then you have to be true to your principles, not to what people characterize as your principles, and not to have other people identify your principles for you. So I felt, and I, to, I have to say, for the pushback I've gotten, and I, want, I do not want to overstate that. It's been in some quarters, a lot of people probably might disapprove, but haven't said very much. The overwhelming sense that I've gotten in this country is we're doing something that's important to America. Uh, for America and for the values of America. And people come up to David and I and thank us for the, our role. Well, it might have been a modest role, but it was a role somehow in changing how things are going. And I, I um, have tried to reach out to conservative media outlets to speak to conservatives. I've tried in every way I possibly can. And I'm, I'm totally convinced that the time is coming very rapidly. If you speak to young Republicans yes. or young conservatives, it's over, you know. That issue is over. There are people that feel strongly because of their religion, religious background and so forth, and they may take some additional um, convincing, mm -hmm. but the time will come. My mother's 94 years old and a really strong conservative, and she told a reporter who got a hold of her. <laughs> Yeah. I apologize little, on behalf of journalists. Little, little, well, my mother's not afraid of anything. Uh, and she said, um, if they just listen, if they just listen to Ted, they will agree. God bless your mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
so let, let me ask a, a, a tough question. At this point, with the, the sea change um, that has occurred, the people who are really hunkered down in opposition, um, it, it's one of those tough questions. I mean, George Wallace even always would say, you know, I'm not racist. I just, I, I believe in the Constitution and states' rights. Um, are, are the people who are deeply opposed to marriage equality and gay rights at this point, is it fair to call them prejudiced? Is it fair to call them bigoted if they hold those views? David? I wouldn't want to call somebody bigoted. I think it is fair to call them prejudiced. I think, I think that's almost a tautological uh, conclusion. I mean, if you're in, if you're in favor of um, depriving certain citizens of certain civil rights, um, I think that can only be, only to be described as prejudice. Um, and I think you've got to draw a distinction between what people believe and practice in terms of their own personal life and their own personal religious beliefs and what they try to do in terms of imposing those beliefs uh, on the rest of society. I mean, we have a First Amendment of the Constitution that guarantees everyone freedom to exercise their religion. But at the same time, that same First Amendment forbids anyone from trying to impose those religious principles on the rest of society. And so while I have enormous uh, respect for people's individual religious beliefs and believe that they have a right to hold those beliefs, to practice those beliefs in their own personal lives and in their own personal houses of worship, but they cannot take those beliefs outside that house of worship and into the Congress of the United States and in, or into a state legislative body and impose those beliefs on other people. Now, you know, we're still very much in, in you know, mid-debate, and, and, and some people are, are, are holding on tight, and you see some conservatives, one of the tropes you see out a lot is that liberals are bullying people of faith, that it's a bullying, a, a, an attempt to make people care. Just this past week, uh, the CEO of an uh, internet company, Mozilla, uh, resigned because it was found out mm -hmm. that he'd given $1,000 to the Prop 8 effort. Um, how do you navigate that space when you're talking to your conservative colleagues who may be uh, raising these, these concerns? Well, I think that um, in the first place, I think that was a situation that was maybe unique to that company because of where it was. Um, its employees and some of the, its contractors and, and customers and so forth. Um, as far as the fact that the man made a contribution to support Proposition 8 um, six, seven years ago, that's at a time when the President of the United States was opposed to um, same-sex marriage at the same time. People have evolved with respect to that. It's what, um, I think that was an unfortunate situation, but I think we could make too much of that. I mean, the, ma the major gay and lesbian organizations were not crying out for him not to be able to run that company. That was a matter of the company. What I feel about this, and David has written about this and talked about now the fact that we, when, we, when we perceive of other people as different than ourselves, it's very easy to discriminate against them and to put that, say that they should be treated differently because they're different. Once we realize that they aren't any different, um, then it becomes very, very difficult to discriminate. And so with respect to those issues, we, we, we strongly feel, and we made this point throughout the case, is that we res there were citizens in California that voted for Proposition 8 because they maybe they had a re strong religious convictions, maybe they didn't understand the issues, maybe they hadn't had been fully educated. The trial that we had in San Francisco, a 12-day trial with experts from all over the world that were explaining the history of marriage, the history of discrimination in this country, the damage that's done by stigma, the raising of families, the raising of children, the happiness that comes from marriage, all of those things was an education to us too and was an education to the gay and lesbian activists who were with us in the trial. They kept coming up to us and saying, I, I didn't know some of those things. Mm -hmm. you know, so it was an education. So when uh, uh, Justice, Ren um, Justice Ginsburg, in, in one of the cases that she decided, said we come to know more about ourselves and we know about um, our fellow citizens 
It changes our perspective, perspective, and it changes the way we think about our fellow citizens. So this issue of bullying, I think it is very important for people. That's why David and I maybe can, can be spokespersons on this thing, because we're talking to people and say, you're not, we don't want to jam these views down your throat, but we do want you to understand what this country is all about. And that the, I want you to ask David about his cross-examination of the leading expert, <laughs> the leading expert on the other side of this case, who was an advocate for only heterosexual marriage, and he, well, I'll let David. This is an I'll let David. Story. I'll let yeah. David yeah. explain it, but he yeah. turned this whole thing yeah. around. And, and and this goes to the question of harm, and yes. and also how people's hearts can change, and sometimes right. the, the the courage and blowback that that, that occurs right. after that. Right. Tell the story of David Blankenhorn. Well, uh, D David Blankenhorn was the chief um, expert witness for the other side in our Proposition 8 case. And he was a longtime advocate of uh, limiting marriage to a man and a woman. And, um, but, he, but he was somebody who was a, a serious uh, person who, who thought about issues. And during the cross-examination, which was lengthy and sometimes quite bitter, um, uh, we took him through what damage this kind of discrimination did to people. And he admitted that it caused serious harm, both economic and emotional, to gay and lesbian couples. He admitted that it caused great harm to the children that they were raising. And he finally admitted that it was inconsistent with the American ideals of equality. And um, at one point, near the end of the cross-examination, um, agreed that we would be more American the day we permitted same-sex marriage. Um, um, That's a good lawyer. Right? And, um, <laughs> and um, while he didn't uh, completely change uh, on the stand, thinking about it in the months after the trial uh, led him to write an op-ed piece um, in the New York Times in which he said that he was wrong, um, that he believed that everyone should have the right to marry the person that he loved, and he, he was sorry for the pain that the position that he had taken and that some others had taken uh, had caused his fellow citizens. Um, so I think that this is something that people's views, even uh, advocates, even harsh advocates, their views uh, can change. And I think what you're seeing in this country is the openness of people to think about issues and to change. And I think that uh, if, if Ted and I have made a, made a contribution uh, to this, it has been in part by having the ability to make people listen. Um, the odd couple aspect of it is sometimes overblown, but it did get us a lot of ink. And it did, it did get us a lot of attention and the ability to talk to the American people. And um, uh, Adlai Stevenson's promise to talk sense to the American people did not work out perfectly for him at the presidential level. Um, but I think that we have had a lot of success on this issue, uh, talking, talking sense to the American people. And on, on, the, on the Mozilla thing, I think that the right thing is not to um, attack or criticize uh, people. It is an attempt to show them um, why they're wrong. And you won't always succeed, but you'll succeed, as David, the Blank, David Blankenhorn example shows, you can, you can succeed. Uh, and my personal religious faith is one that believes in redemption. And I would, uh, I would say that this is a country that depends on redemption. Um, all of us have discriminated at various times. Certainly anybody that's as old as Ted and I have. Are. We, we grew up in an era of discrimination and in an era in which we were not nearly as sensitive um, as we should have been to the extent of discrimination and the pain and the damage caused. So I think that we all need to you know, be sensitive that we need redemption and everybody else does too. And we need to bring people in, uh, not, I wouldn't call it bullying, 
uh, but not attack them, uh, try to reason with them. And, and I'll just add one more thing that one, one of the things that we learned or among the things that we learned during the course of this case and during the course of the trial and listening to the experts talk about discrimination and the effect of discrimination on people's lives, the victims of discrimination, it taught us more about racial discrimination and religious discrimination and discrimination based upon characteristics that people have no control over. I think I, think I learned an enormous amount. I, 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 just listening to that trial to seeing the effect of that kind of conduct um, that is so un-American -Ameri un uh, on our fellow citizens and, and how much damage it can do to young people, uh, particularly the suicide rate, for example, of young people who are struggling with their sexual identity. But it, wasn't, it isn't just discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, it's all kinds of discrimination that we were found that we were fighting um, and we learned a lot. So this is part of a a larger narrative, it's clear, and it's part of a personal journey for you all as well. Um, it sounds like this case, your partnership has not only raised your profile, but caused you to change mm. and look back on your past and, and maybe reflect differently upon it. Um, has that been the general effect? Are we in a place where that narrative is going to continue unabated? Do you really feel that this is a, going to be a settled issue in 10 or so years, and what do you think the obstacles ahead may well be? How do you bust off your crystal ball as a lawyer yeah. when you look at these cases? Well, I, I do think, I do think um, this is going to be a settled issue in this country. I think all you have to do is look at the demographics, um, and, and those demographics don't uh, vary that much depending on what region of the country you are in or what political affiliation you or your parents have or even what religion you have. Um, there is a broad acceptance on people under 30 um, and I think that that is going to settle the issue uh, in this country. But we don't, we can't forget that there's a large world out there. Um, I mean, you still have the Vladimir Putins of the world, you mm -hmm. still have the Ayatollahs of the world uh, preaching in this particular area uh, discrimination in a very uh, vicious way. And I think that you can't um, ignore the fact that this is something in which we have joined a community of nations that includes countries as diverse as Spain, South Africa, Norway, Britain, France, uh, Canada, but there are a lot of other places in the world in which this battle has not even begun uh, yet, uh, let alone uh, achieve the place that I think we are achieving here in the United States. So this is, this is something that's going to go on, I think, for a long time, uh, although I do think that we will have that issue settled in this country. In, in some cases, there's active regression in, in yes. Africa in particular. Yes. I mean, the penalties have yes. actually ratcheted up in the calendar year. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's places where it's a, it's a capital offense right. um, to be gay. Um, as, as David mentioned Putin, it was to advocate right. um, human rights for gay and lesbian citizens. It's a crime um, in, in Russia. Um, however, um, in the course of the time that we've been involved in this issue, eight or nine nations have changed. Uh, France has changed, the United Kingdom has changed, Scotland's changed, and places in Mexico, and there's a numerous countries now where the real right to marriage is being protected, and that is spreading wider. I think if you look and at what David said about the demographics, it is the young people of this country who are the future of this country, of course, but the polls are changing in the, in the 30 to 45 age, in the 45 to 60 age, in the 60 and above age, starting to get into territory that David and I occupy. Um, it's changing all across the board. So I do think, and maybe I'm an optimistic, but we felt when we started this case that we felt that we, we, we kidded one another. We thought that with respect to the Supreme Court, that, that David would take care of the justices that he won over in Bush versus Gore, and I'd do the others, and we'd have a nine to zero <laughs> outcome. Uh, we didn't quite get that, 
but uh, that, that's still potentially in the future. I think maybe we're pretty optimistic about this because of the reaction that we've seen, reaction that we see here. We've spoke in various other organizations and groups. Uh, you mentioned that there's a documentary coming out called The Case Against Aid. I hope everybody will see that HBO documentary. It's an extraordinary moving depiction of and this case. It, it will be out um, in June, June 23rd, I think it is. HBO will be releasing it. There will be screenings and it'll be in theaters maybe at around the same time. Um, people can't watch that documentary without understanding um, the, the feelings of the gay and lesbian uh, couples that we, the two couples that we represented. You will love them at the end of this. Mm -hmm documentary and you will want them to have the right to get married and that's going to affect a lot of people. Uh, we believe that this is an issue but it's very important that we continue to talk about it. It's very important that we've had an opportunity for which we're very grateful to be here. Um, we're, very, we're very grateful for the opportunity to speak to anybody we can speak to because we do believe that the time is going to come. And one of the things that's happened, I'll just mention this, the more it, it is accepted that your sexual orientation um, it, it does not make you different fundamentally than any other American. The more gays and lesbians are coming out and recognizing and acknowledging their sexual identity, or their sexual orientation, the more people then realize, oh, my friend down the street, or my neighbor, or my coworker who I love and respect, or the person that sells me books, or my doctor, or my lawyer, uh, there's a, that's a gay person. I love them. I respect them. I want them to have the same rights as me. That is a is a cycle. It's snowball. You know, more people come out, more people recognize the, that that gay and lesbian people are just like us. And the more we can talk about it, the we, if we can contribute to that, we we're very anxious to do that. And, and that does seem to be part of the game change. There's been a strategic yeah. shift as well as a tactical shift in this element of the civil rights movement, where where it hasn't been solely activist driven, but it's been about forming coalitions. It's been about getting Republicans in New York State. Right. Uh, my wife, Margaret Hoover, who's mm -hmm. active on the Republican side of this issue, uh, worked on that. And, 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 and that is really a sea change in the approach to civil rights away from a, a more activist approach, isn't it? Well, I think it is a combination of it. I, th I think you still have the activist approach, but I think you're also um, at a point where you can reach out and build a coalition, broadening. And broadening, broadening the coalition. And that's very, different. That's very hopeful for an issue. It's, it's is huge. Big. The, the yeah. foundation, for, uh, which yeah. Margaret um, is so instrumental in, was an enormous contributor. And Paul Singer um, uh, was, was an enormous, a very conservative political person, was enormously helpful to our case and helpful in New York in changing the legislature in New York and, and had an effect in Maine. And uh, conservatives in the financial community who have been helping us. And that is also um, uh, a, a snowball has its own momentum, um, uh, and the uh, the more conservatives come out and, and uh, uh, with respect to this issue, other conservatives saying, "Well, I guess I guess it's, yeah, it's okay. okay, and I, yeah, I will yeah, join that." And right. I mean, it may, it's a huge difference. Yeah. And, and David, I mean, as uh, you know, as a Democrat. Yeah. You know, I think it's very easy for people to tee off on Republicans on this issue because there is a social conservative opposition which is still very vociferous, you know, trying to say that now that one of the rhetorical attacks the Family Research Council is taking is that it's about defense of natural marriage, you know, various rhetorical games that occur at different points. But, but the instrumental role that conservatives and Republicans have played in, in shifting the calculus strategically outside the courtroom. As a Democrat speak to that about the impact that Republicans for freedom uh, to marry have had in, in helping change the environment, at least politically. Well, I, I, think, I think it's helped in, in, a, in a couple of different ways, both, in, both of which are important. I think it has, as, as Ted says, um, it has encouraged other people to look at this issue. And I really believe that when you look at this issue and you just sort of step back from it and you, and you try to leave the way you were taught, the way you grew up, the things that you heard when you were a kid, and you try to leave that behind you and you just think about this issue, I think you really only do come out one way. Um, and so I think that one of the things that, that Ted has been, been such a great leader on and these other people have been leaders on is to say to Republicans and conservatives, step back and think about whether this isn't really exactly what your values are. 
Um, if, you, if you believe in family values, if you believe in the traditional values, um, isn't this exactly what you ought to be telling people that they ought to be doing? Um, and I, I, think it's been, I think it's been very valuable in that respect. I think the second thing that it's been very valuable to is there are a lot of Democrats in this country and a lot of Republicans in this country, uh, but there's a lot of people who are independent. Um, there are a lot of people who are in the middle. There are a lot of people, even they may identify themselves as Republican or Democrat, who really are thinking more about the issues and the personalities than they are about the party. And I think that a, a second thing that was very valuable for the um, conservative and Republican participation in this was to say to that middle ground, this is not an issue of liberals or conservatives, activists, inactivists, Republicans, Democrats. This is a civil rights, a constitutional issue. And so I think that the broadening of the base has been important to get at that independent center. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what you've seen is people reacting to the fact that you've had people like Singer and Melman and Olson and people strongly identified with conservative and, and uh, Republican issues uh, taking the stand. And that's led people to rethink it. And it's led Republicans and conservatives to rethink it. But I also think it's led Democrats and independents to rethink it. Um, because uh, while um, you, you know, as a Democrat, I like to think that we are doing better than the Republicans on this issue, um, we don't have a great record in civil rights. Um, I mean, the people that were trying to block um, the um, 1964 Civil Rights Act were mostly Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a, as a party, we've got to be uh, alert to the fact that uh, this is not a, this is not, is and should not be, and Lyndon Johnson succeeded because he made clear that it was not a partisan issue. That's right, as a Southern Democrat right, right. taking that on. Right. Um, just in, in the final few minutes, you, you two have a book coming out that has a, yes. a Martin Luther King reference in the title, right. which seems a, an appropriate right. way to tie it all up. Right. Redeeming the Dream uh, is, is the title. Um, and it, it, it's a book uh, that Ted and I wrote together uh, about this journey, about uh, how we came together, um, about the case, uh, about our plaintiffs, um, who are really the heart of the story. Uh, one of the things that we thought we were going to do is we thought they were going to televise the trial. The trial court had agreed, the uh, Court of Appeals, um, Federal Court of Appeals had agreed, and then at the last minute the United States Supreme Court stopped at 5-4. Uh, but one of the regrets that I think we have is that people didn't get a chance to see our plaintiffs on the witness stand. Because when they got on the stand and asked, just responded to simple questions, like, who are you? How does it feel not to be able to marry the person you love? Why do you want to marry this person? Uh, you could not listen to that testimony and not be moved. I don't think anybody in that courtroom, regardless of what your position was in that litigation, was not m moved by the humanity and the human drama of that testimony. And I think that they are our best advocate. They were our best evidence. They were our best lawyers, in effect. They weren't lawyers, but they, the, the power of what they did uh, was so much better than I think either Ted or I could do in explaining the issue. Uh, and I think one of the things that that documentary does uh, very well is to tell that story. Um, I think that we try to do that a little bit in the book. I don't think we do as good a job as they could have done uh, if we could have televised their testimony. Uh, but we try to do a part of bringing to the American people who they are, why this was important, what it means to them and their children, and what the significance of that ought to be for this issue. Some people think of um, uh, this country, that, that country over there is a piece of geography or a piece of history. This country is a dream. Right. And so that's what Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech uh, means, and that's why it has so much resonance. And we celebrated an anniversary of that speech um, just last summer, as I recall. Um, and rereading that 
speech um, reminds us of what America is. And, and having a conference like this that talks about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 reminds us of what America is. And what the plaintiffs testifying in this case talked about their dreams and what it was like for them growing up and what their dream was for their families and their future and their children and what their children would be like growing up and how their children would be treated. Those are the dreams that we were talking about and Martha King and Lyndon Johnson was talking about. So we named the book Redeeming the Dream. This is the dream of gay and lesbian citizens. And overcoming Proposition 8 was redeeming that dream for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that if you, if you talk to any of the victims of discrimination throughout our history, whether it's racial, religious, gender, or whatever, uh, they would say the same thing. They would, they, would, they would talk about the pain and the emotional, the economic harm, the harm to their children, all the things that um, gay and lesbian citizens have been talking about in this context. So I think that brings it back into the parallels that you see to civil rights movements that have taken place over the last 200 years in this country. Well, that's the extraordinary thing, and thank you for all you're doing. When you can have freedom and equality, not in tension, but in concert, right. that's when we've reached our highest ideal. Thank you for doing so much to advance our nation. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, there will be a short pause. Our program will resume momentarily. establishing preferences, a nation that was built by the immigrants of all lands can ask those who now seek admission, what can you do for our country? But we should not be asking, in what country were you born? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Ben Barnes. If you would all please take your seats, please. We'll start our next panel.
Thank you very much. If everyone would please be seated, we'd like to stay on schedule for television and for all of our purposes. Many view the Immigration Act that Lyndon Johnson signed into law on Liberty Island in, in the New York Harbor in 1965 as a landmark in civil rights. By lifting the 50-year-old rigid quotas based on nationality, the law dealt another blow to bigotry that had held back America's promise. Today's panel, Immigration, Pathway to the American Dream, will look at immigration reform today, 50 years after Lyndon Johnson signed the Immigration Act into law. Our panelists are, now in his third term as mayor of San Antonio, Julio Castro, considered by many a rising star in American politics. A leading voice for immigration reform, the mayor has worked tirelessly in positioning San Antonio to be a leader in the new energy economy, attracting well-paying jobs to San Antonio in the 21st century industries, and raising education attained to the, across the spectrum. Governor Haley Barber has been many in many roles in government in the last few years. In all those roles, I might add, he has played and done a, an outstanding job. He served as governor of Mississippi from 2004 to 2012. As he served as chairman of the Republican Governors Conference for two of those years. Since leaving office, he has returned to the BRG group, which he founded. And he also today is co-chairman of a bipartisan policy center immigration task force. The moderator, Brian Sweeney, is a senior executive editor of Texas Monthly, and he's recently been named a new generation of fellows for the Robert L. Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mayor Castro, Governor Barber, and Brian Sweeney. It is an absolute pleasure to be here today as part of this uh, historic event here in Austin. Uh, very thrilled to be on the stage with Governor Barber, Mayor Castro. I'd like to thank all of you for being here in the audience today to hear us talk about immigration, which is one of the vital issues facing our country today. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you who are watching at your computers and at home on live stream. It's excellent to have the opportunity to expand the audience and bring more people in uh, to, to watch the event. Let's start quickly with uh, the bill that Governor Barnes has mentioned. This was the 1965 bill. Um, as he had said, it changed the quota system, which had been in place for a long time, uh, referring to the National Origins Act of the 1920s. And you know, one of the things that President Johnson had thought was that as a Southerner, he was often, or members of his caucus were often looked down upon by the rest of the country, perhaps, for having been a Southerner. And he felt that this law that had been in place for so long essentially did the very same thing. It had very, very strict limits on immigration from countries in the Asia Pacific, for example, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe. And he felt that what essentially we were doing then was looking down on those countries and wanted to change that. In fact, he had said at the time to then Speaker John McCormick that there was no bill before the Congress that was more worthy of passage based on its decency and its equity than this immigration bill. And President Johnson, no stranger to theater, having the, the signing ceremony on Liberty Island is something that we've probably come to expect. So in that vein, let's start there. In terms of the notion of immigration as a civil right, which I suspect that a lot of people agree with, but then other people may, as they're wrestling with this issue, as a contentious issue, may have a harder time with that. And so let, let's start there. How do you sort of size up immigration? Is it a civil right? Do you see it as a, an economic issue or what? And let's start with Governor Barber as a guest to our state. Well, thank you, Brian. For, uh, for me, 1965 happened to be the year I graduated from high school. And so uh, I'm glad you didn't ask me to comment on the policy uh, <laughs> that we had there. But look, in, in our country, we, we have always been a country of immigrants. You know, my great grandfather came here from Ireland, and we can look around the state of Mississippi where. We don't have the kind of immigration, and in, and in the mid-60s when this was going on, we did not have the kind of immigrant populations of today. We had Yugoslavs who had fled the Ottoman Empire at the turn of the century. We had 
Lebanese and Syrians who had fled the Ottoman Empire at the turn of the century. Christians who had tried to escape and had ended up in our right. neck of the woods, frankly, because they couldn't get in New York. Right. <laughs> so they came in, they right. came in New Orleans and came up and came up the river. But the equitable purpose that you talked about is obviously something that has to be part of immigration policy. Okay. You know, I, as, as Ben mentioned, I co-chair the Immigration Reform Task Force for the Bipartisan Policy Center. And equity is part of what this right. has to be right. about, and, that, and that's what President Johnson apparently was trying to accomplish. And as we have immigration reform, as I believe we will in the very near future, also it has to be equitable. Okay, well certainly we want to talk about where we are in Congress right now with immigration reform, whether it is stalled or not stalled. We'll talk about the Gang of Eight, and I, I think that's an excellent direction to move in. Let me start though with, with you, Mayor Castro, in terms of your views of, of immigration and framing it as a civil right. Is that the way that you see it? And as you're talking to people about immigration and immigration reform, I know that you've appeared before Congress. You've worked closely with President Obama th on this particular issue. How do you see it in the context of the 21st century? Well, I see it in a very similar vein, uh, because if you look at our nation's history, uh, as the governor was saying, what we see are different groups who both were coming to the United States and then when they lived in the United States were seen as other and treated that way. Of course, you know, folks will remember Benjamin Franklin uh, and his remarks about the Germans right. ruining the nation right. and so forth. And you can just go on along the line of, of folks who were different and who were new. Uh, and, and when we think about what we classically think of the civil rights movement, uh, that's what it was about. It was about people who were seen as different and whether they would be treated equally or not. And so immigrants have had throughout the generations, in that sense, uh, a similar experience. Right, right. Um, I also believe that, that when we think of it or ask, is it a civil right, you can say yes in the sense that it not only impacts folks who are not citizens yet, it impacts folks who are citizens. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, there are about a million folks in our country who have a spouse who is an undocumented immigrant. And we just talked about the importance of marriage as a fundamental right and, and being able to be with the person that you're, you want to be with and that you love. Um, and maybe the best example are these dreamers, mm -hmm. uh, young people who were brought here through no fault of their own, for all intents and purposes, uh, they are Americans. The United States is what they know. Uh, and the question is now, are they gonna be able to have the same opportunities and be treated equally? So in that sense, I see it in the same vein as uh, the civil rights movement. Okay, and we in fact do have a, a bill right now in Congress related to that with a de defense appropriation in terms of people who had been here, or come here as you say through no fault of their own. Would they be able to achieve some level of legal status through service in the military or college education or something like that? And that right now is being held up as well. But let me dial in because we have said so far immigration in the very broad sense and I think that's the right way to talk about it. But we're also talking about two different types of immigration, right? We're talking about the legal immigration system which I think everybody believes is broken, and if you disagree, let's certainly talk about that. But we're also talking about the notion of what is illegal immigration, people who do come in here on their own um, uh, 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 for whatever reasons, economic or, or, or otherwise. So do you see it in the same, is it all one umbrella to you, legal versus legal in terms of a civil right, or are there distinctions to be made? Well, of, of course there are distinctions. Uh, it does count whether someone followed the, the normal legal process right. or not. Uh, and, and I believe that that's, what, that's reflected right. uh, in what is a punitive aspect to the legislation that was passed out of the Senate and now is in front of the House of Representatives. So sure, uh, you know, we want to encourage a more robust uh, and, and active legal immigration system first and foremost. However, uh, we also have to recognize that for a variety of reasons, usually to make a better life for themselves and their families, that we have 11 to 12 million people who are here uh, who are illegal, undocumented, whatever word you use. Um, we also have folks who initially came here uh, as students or on a visa and right. they got into the country right. perfectly legally right. and then overstayed that right. visa and there have been estimates that that ranges from 15 to 45 percent right. of the folks that we talk about as illegal immigrants. So it is complicated, there are distinctions. Sure. Governor Barber, do you? Well, I, I would just like to pick up, I'm glad Mayor Castro mentioned the people who are referred to as overstayers 
people who come here legally on a legal visa just don't go home when they're supposed to. I'm sort of on the high end of the, of the uh, estimate. I, I think more than 40% of the people here illegally actually didn't cross the border illegally. They came here perfectly legal and just didn't go home when they were supposed to. And, and uh, that could be four or five million of the 11 million. So I hope today when we talk about border security, which is something I think the American people are very concerned about, want to make sure that they don't have happen what happened in 86, right. when Alan Simpson, for whom the bill is named, said the first thing we said we do is control the border, and we haven't done it. So when we talk about that, I hope people will also be thinking in terms of people who came here legally on a visa and overstayed, because those you got to solve those two right. issues together, right. not separately. So I'm uh, put me down for endorsing what the mayor said. All right, very good, G Governor Barber. You, you certainly have had a long career in public service, as you've talked about. You Emphasize were, long. Okay. <laughs> Chairman of the Republican National Committee, uh, say two-term governor of Mississippi. Do you feel personally that your views on this the subject have changed over time? Uh, was there a place that you were years ago and now you've come to it? Or places where you see that the party has changed either in, in a way that you would approve of or disapprove of? I wonder if you could just sort of talk about that over time as this issue has, I, I think, become more and more heated. Yeah, I, I would be very honest with you. I didn't have much in the way of views on this growing up 50 years ago when this passed. This, this wasn't a, much of an issue in Mississippi for the reasons I touched on. Nothing like Texas or, right. or border, border states. Right. Uh, but look, I, I was raised to believe we are a country of immigrants, my own family and every family here for that matter, and that, that we're better for that, that we're a better country for that. My party is a big party. Okay. I mean, just remember the two-party system, both parties necessarily are broad coalitions, and both of them are much broader than a lot of people like to admit or give credit for. So there's a diversity of views in the Republican Party, but I have to say that my views about uh, immigration policy are just pure and simple. It is in the best interest of America, economically and for other reasons, that we have immigration reform and that we take the 11 million people that are here and give them the opportunity to be here legally so that they is the term is get out of the shadows. Uh, but anyway, those views didn't change a lot because 25 years ago I didn't have any. <laughs> right. You know? Right. And coming off of the 2012 election, you had said, for example, that you felt that the Republican Party needed to stay the course on its core values, but it did need to change its thinking on immigration. Do you have a sense right now of the, the leaders in your party that you think are pointing the right direction, that, that, if, that you, well, you, they have proposals out there that you think not only are sort of it's good policy becomes good politics, but are also have the opportunity to move this forward? Speaker Boehner clearly wants to the House this session, this year, to pass an immigration reform package. Right. It's not going to be the same package as the Senate. It's not going to be one bill. But it is an immigration reform package that he presented to the House Republican Conference a few weeks ago, the principles, uh, which I'm pretty comfortable with. I don't claim to agree on every jot and sure. tittle. But uh, I think they're going to try to do that this year. Right. They don't have the votes right now. Right. They're going to try to get the votes, and I think it's in America's best interest. Uh, set aside politics. For, for, for our, we're in a global battle for capital and labor, uh, and, and we need the labor. It's not just H-1B labor that okay. we need. We right. need essential labor in a lot, a lot of areas, and uh, we can go into that longer. But, yeah, I think they're trying to do the right thing. Not easy, and there's certainly not unanimity of opinion. Right, right. Uh, Mayor Castro, let me come back to you on that and essentially the same question. Uh, has your personal view of immigration, the, the complexity of the political issue, changed over time? And how do you see that reflective in your party? What leaders are you looking to that you think are kind of carrying the torch in the right direction and maybe picking up from President Johnson's cue in 1965? I don't know that my views have changed on it. Um, so much as I've learned more about the issue, of course, being more involved in it and, and going up to testify and watching it 
uh, unfold uh, a few years ago and now today in more detail. And so it's just been a process of learning more about the issue. Uh, I believe there have been folks on both sides of the aisle who have been good on the issue. Right. Uh, we had, uh, uh, we're going to have one of them as, as a speaker, George right. W. Bush, right. who a few years ago and also when he was here as governor of Texas, I think set the right tone and, and did a good job on this issue of articulating why it's important to bring folks into the fold. Uh, President Obama has done a lot uh, in terms of DACA uh, mm -hmm. and trying to ensure that administratively he's done what he could, and I know he's looking at new things that he can possibly right. do. Uh, but in the Congress is really where you've, on the Democratic side, seen a lot of activity with uh, Congressman Gutierrez, for instance, right. who has been a real champion, uh, particularly for DREAMers and for the undocumented, and trying to ensure that uh, this eventually gets a vote on the House floor. Okay. If we take a look at all of the issues that are facing this, and it's not, it would be nice to take the politics out of it, but of course that's where we end up in terms of there's a log jam in Congress moving forward. There are a lot of different issues I think that are worth discussing. You do have enforcement on one hand. Uh, you do have uh, legal visas, whether or not we're, the legal system right now is as effective as it should be. Uh, we do have you know, issues with um, uh, other things related to security and kind of economic freedoms, uh, people being able to come out of the shadows, as we say. What are the number one things that, that you are hearing, Governor Barber, that are the, the places that are giving people the most pause on this subject? So that of, of all of the things that we may or may not agree about in, in this very complicated issue, what are the things that you are hearing that people are struggling with the most in getting behind some form of either comprehensive immigration reform, which is what we look like we might be going to get from the Gang of Eight last year out of the Senate, to what may be now more of a piecemeal fashion, that is assuming anything goes through? Well, I think, first of all, the American people demand that we secure the border. Okay. They've been promised that once, and no, nobody believes that that actually happened. Right. Uh, the, the recession was the great border secure, exactly not, right. uh, not anything that the government did. No administration of any party, my party or the Democratic Party, has ever done diddly to enforce our visa laws. I mean, it's just been uh, a sieve. And, and so I think the American people, I think generally are for immigration reform. They think the status quo is about the worst thing that we can have. Okay. But immigration reform, they don't want to go through this again. You know, they've been promised this once, and this, you know, fool me once, shame on me if you fool me the second time. <laughs> and so I, don't, I think border security and visa enforcement is, is, uh, is, is really important to people. Secondly, people want to be assured that it is an economic and a fiscal plus. Okay which I am very comfortable that it is, that this is good for our economy and it's good for the Treasury. If we do this the right way, deficits will be smaller. We'll have more revenue. We'll have a stronger economy, right. which gives you, again, more revenue. I think those are probably the first two big okay. things. Then you have the, the underlying issue that has to be dealt with, and that is, Americans don't want people to be rewarded for breaking the law. Okay. So how do you do this in an appropriate way that recognizes that somebody has broken the law, but allows them to become here, to be here legally in kind of a probationary way that they pay some sort of penalty for, you know, for breaking the law. I always tell the story, my, my Irish great-grandfather they never threatened to send him back to Ireland because he had whiskey during, the, during Prohibition. <laughs> and, uh, but it was against the law if somebody right. had wanted to fine him or something. That, but uh, I, I think that has to be dealt with. And I think that can be dealt with in a very appropriate right. way that's fair, equitable to, to people. Uh, you, you, I mentioned Prohibition because when we're not enforcing the law, at the border, we're not enforcing in our uh, visa laws. It's partially our fault. Right, right. That it may be entirely our fault. fault. Right. You know, it's, well, it's at least partially right. our fault. So uh, the, the two the two big issues that I mentioned, uh, and then the underlying issue that you have to deal with is you're not rewarding people for breaking the law, and I think that's 
that can be done in a way that's very, very appropriate and right. And I think one of the, the underlying fundamental challenges has been, because I agree with the governor that oftentimes a stumbling block is this issue of border security, right. but one of the underlying problems is that when people say border security, uh, rarely is that ever defined. Right. What does that actually mean? Right. I think, you know, if we're realistic, are we ever gonna get the number of people who cross the border down to zero? No. Are you gonna get it down to 1,000? 10,000, 100,000, that has not been adequately defined in the policy debate. Right. And so uh, folks are able to, to use that politically right. in a way right. that kind of ends the discussion. And I think, uh, uh, Governor, that you're right, has, has prevented uh, you know, one of our political parties from taking this up on the floor of the House of Representatives because people don't feel like the issue of border security has been dealt with, and maybe it hasn't, but we haven't even defined what border security would be. Right. I saw one number that was thrown out, um, and I can't remember who threw it out now. Uh, I'm turning 40 this year, so I'm starting to forget things. Oh. You know? um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I know, I got a long way to go. It's fine, you'll be fine. But the, the person said, <laughs> the person said that, that 80 to 90% reduction in the number of folks uh, coming across would be essentially a secure border. Well, you know, if you go back 10 years and you compare where we were 10 years ago to where we are now, I mean, there's been, I don't know that it's been 89%, but it's been gigantic. Now, the governor rightly points out that a lot of that is due to the fact that for the last couple of years, Mexico, for instance, has had a, a higher growth rate, economic growth rate, right. than the United States. Right. And so during this recession, we've seen less people coming over here for opportunity right. when they can find the opportunity over there. Um, uh, but still, we have the challenge of how do you define a, an acceptable level okay. of border security? We've doubled the number of agents on the southwest right. border. We've uh, built out basically the fence right. uh, that was envisioned mid-decade, 10 years ago. Uh, we have deployed technology uh, and, and more manpower to go and try and secure it. We're looking for drug tunnels underground right. uh, along the, the California border and probably the other parts of the border. So it, how do you get to the definition right. of border security? Right, and I, I think that that does become the thing that certainly we hear as, uh, as part of the magazine as we're talking to people across the state that that's something that they feel very strongly about, so strongly in, about it, in fact, that they feel that it needs to be the critical first step, but as you say, it's very difficult to define. So let me throw a couple of numbers out at you as we think about that. Um, so we share a 1,954 mile border with Mexico, and Texas has 1,254 miles of that. We have fenced off approximately 110 miles of our border with Mexico. Uh, we have you know, pretty severe terrain in some places where fencing uh, is not either necessary or would be appropriate. Um, and sort of you know, areas in, the, in Big Bend, again, where it, would just, it wouldn't make any sense. Now, during the time since 2001, the September of 11 attacks, we have increased the number of Border Patrol agents uh, along the Rio Grande by 117%, as you say. So around 9,000 uh, Border Patrol agents to above 21,000 Border Patrol agents. Now, that's for the entire border. But it does sort of show how things have changed. And as we see this new package coming through, we're continuing to hear the phrase, boots on the ground, more boots on the ground. Are we comfortable with that? Is that the right direction for us to be running in? Um, and if, if so, how do we find the, the gap in terms of measuring progress on this? Uh, or is that something that gets thrown up on this issue that, is, as you suggest, perhaps, is not achievable and then just forestalls any progress on the issue? Well, I think the American people are willing to spend money to have a secure border. Now, I, I think the Senate bill, unfortunately, is all about spending money. Right. I, I think the mayor touched on a critical thing. What is the standard? We have to set a standard. Right. I mean, that, it isn't going to be zero. And, you know, anybody in his right mind knows it's not going to be zero. I don't know what it is. I think the Senate bill actually tried to, right. to talk some about that. But what the American people want is, okay, set a standard, then meet it. They want the standard met. They don't want to say, spend X dollars and put all the, all the boots on the ground and the 
the balloons and the, and the drones and the whatever, they want it to work. Right. And they're willing to pay something for okay. it to work. But that's where I think the Senate bill kind of misses the point. It's, it sort of says, we're going to spend all this money, and then in so many years, if it hadn't worked, we're going to appoint a commission. Right. P people don't want a commission. Okay. People want a secure border. No, I think that folks definitely want a secure border. I do think that we have to define it, and there are different ways to approach that. I mean, you could define it in terms of, of progress in, in, over a certain number of years instead of a, a distinct number. Uh, I mean, we've seen apprehensions at a 40-year low uh, last year, and so we have seen a lot of progress. What its, its causes are, I think, are a matter of debate. Uh, but I do think that it, it counts for something that we're spending more resources on it. Um, we need to show those results. The other thing, as the governor pointed out, is that we haven't done much uh, about people who overstay their visa. And, and ensuring that we have a way to track who comes in and then whether they leave uh, in a more effective and efficient way is an important part of this. And, and I can usually tell the people that are serious about the policy and the folks who are just using it as a political wedge issue because the people who are serious about the policy and actually care about the issue always speak to the issue of overstayers and give a full mm -hmm. picture mm -hmm. of the problem. Right. And the folks that are using it as red meat out there only talk about securing the border, securing the border and, uh, and what we need to do there and ignore the fact that, that as you say, maybe up to 40 or 45% of the folks have nothing to do with actually crossing right, the border. Right. Why is there perhaps to be spending some of that money, as you say, on looking at people with the expired visas or things like that? Is, it, is there a, a way that you begin to make people feel better about the problem if the money isn't spent uh, particularly on the pressure point of the border? Sure. Is that? Oh, I think so, sure. And, and I believe that the Senate uh, version of the legislation okay. does address that, mm -hmm. uh, interior security. Um, but just in people's minds, uh, that has not occupied the same specter and, and okay. caused the same fear right. uh, that, that this issue of folks coming across the border has. Okay. But it is undercovered by the press. That, that you, you would hardly know that a huge percentage, millions of these people came here legally. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if you, you ask the question, should, we, should that be part of it? You betcha. I mean, if we don't do that, we're kidding ourselves. We're, we're, we're not. Right. You know, we're not making any, not making much real progress. Right. But I right. think everybody understands that now. But I just want to make sure the audience no. knows when we, t when I no. use the word border security, I include visa enforcement at the same time. Right. Right. It takes me long enough to talk when I'd say half as many words. So <laughs> I, <laughs> well, let, let's talk about where things stand right now. A lot of people look back to the immigration reforms that took place under the Reagan administration as perhaps one of the last big sort of serious uh, approaches that were, was able to get through successfully. So I wonder if we might just spend a minute talking about what it looked like back then. Obviously, the country is a much different place. I think we should talk about that from a political standpoint. I think partisan uh, passions are much higher now, perhaps, than they were back then. But you were also at a moment where you had a second-term president coming into the last midterm election with a divided Congress, which sounds kind of familiar to what's happening today. Sure. But as the joke is going around Congress now is that they can't agree on you know, how to pass the time of day, much less some level of comprehensive immigration reform or even piecemeal. So can you help us size up what are the practical opportunities for movement on this issue, if any exist? Well, let me say, it, it, uh, coincidentally, I was political director of the White House in 1985 right. and 6. Right. Right. And while I wasn't deeply involved in the immigration bill, I was very aware of it. And there was, don't think it was easy. Uh, Simpson would tell you if he were sitting here time and time <laughs> again, it was pronounced dead. Right, right. And, and he said, who saved it? He'd call over the White House and Reagan say, don't worry about my staff get this done, let's go another step, try another thing. You had a president very, very much behind it, and you had a lot of disagreement in our party. You had disagreement in our administration. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way of the world. Right, but right. the president was very involved directly with the guys who were at the top. So it wasn't, wasn't easy. Of course, 
it was as close as you can get to amnesty. I mean, it, it was, it, it, they didn't have the kind of robust and rigorous requirements of people that are expected under the Senate bill. Right. And, and in my opinion, the House bill will be somewhat to the right of the Senate bill. And I use the term the House bill. It'll be a package of bills. Right. But I think it will amount to a comprehensive package of bills. And it'll be further to the right uh, than, than, than what you got right now out of the Senate. But it wasn't easy in 1986. It wasn't like everybody thought this was a wonderful right. idea. Right. Right. And clearly it was not as well done as we would have liked for it to be, or we wouldn't be in the shape we're in right now sure. with, with 11 million or so people here illegally. Do you think starting at the White House and working its way, our way down to the leaders of, of both parties, are they pulling hard enough or are they content right now to let people stake out the opposite sides of this issue? Is it more politically expedient for them to beat the issue as a, as a campaign idea than to actually come together to solve it? If you look at the Speaker of the House then, Tip O'Neill, right. he had a lot of opposition in his party from the, from the unions. The unions were very concerned right. about this. Agriculture, tending to be more Republican, they were always more for this. And so there was, it was more bipartisan opposition right. in 1986 than, than it is today. But Speaker O'Neill wanted done and he knew and he and Reagan could work together and knew how to work and they finally got it done. I think Speaker Boehner wants it done just as much for a variety of reasons, political as well as, uh, right. as, well as economic. But where Tip had 280 Democrats, uh, Boehner's got right. 230. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he loses 15 or 16 Republicans, he doesn't have the majority. There were huge Democratic majorities back right. in those days. Right. Right. Uh, I, just, I just think if you look at it, uh, Boehner is being honest when he says, I don't have the votes today. I'm trying to get there. Paul Ryan clearly is working on it. And so are a bunch of others. You mentioned Con Congressman Gutierrez. Now there's a guy that gets rave reviews from both sides right. because more important than politics to him is getting the job done. And that's what he ended up getting the job done in 1986, is that there were a handful of people who just hell bent and determined to get it done. And hopefully I we see. can have the same kind of result this time, but with a, with a better future right. than that one turned out to right. have. Right, right, right. Mayor Castro, are you optimistic for movement uh, this year? And uh, as I had mentioned earlier, you, you've testified before Congress. You've been working with President Obama this issue. How do you size up what the uh, potential for movement is? Yeah, I am optimistic for movement. Let me just say that I was in junior high in 1986, so I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't speak to 1986, <laughs> but let me speak to 2014. Uh, and, and, but I think the governor's right that, that throughout in that legislative process, what you need are folks who are able to work together and who, who are working toward uh, working based off a set of principles. And I do believe that there are enough folks, both Democrats and Republicans, who are willing to work in that way on this issue. I'm hopeful that there are. Uh, just in terms of the mechanics, uh, as we get past these Republican primaries, that may make it easier as some folks, some Republicans get through primaries that they may have feared uh, if they had a Tea Party opponent or somebody farther to the right on this issue, they may have feared getting primaried. That is no longer a concern right. if they get through this cycle and there's some daylight between that primary and, uh, and the general election or the end of the year, or the end of this session. So I do think there's hope. If it does not get done uh, during this calendar year, I do believe that it's gonna get done before the 2016 elections okay. because right. the stakes only go up higher okay. and higher right. for both parties. Yeah. Ma'am, ma'am, thank you. We're, we're, we're trying to have a very civil conversation about this exact topic, and so let us please continue. Thank you. Thank, ma thank you all very much for your perspective. We, we appreciate it. We're, we're still obviously in the middle of this panel, and so please, for, out of respect for all of the people here in the auditorium and all the people watching, I'd encourage you to let us continue and show respect to others. Thank you. 
the big issue that people are going to be talking about, which is in addition to border security, which has been the thing, as you say, has been vexing people, is if we do have 11 to 12 million people who are here, living in the shadows, whatever term that you want to use, if that is one of the major stumbling blocks to something moving forward, right, whether or not um, there is amnesty, which is strongly, strongly rejected in certain areas, whether or not it is a pay a fine, make some restitution, go to the back of the line, and then sort of start over for those people who are ahead of you. What is the best case individually that you would make to an, to an opponent, somebody who is concerned about immigration, as to how to address that very issue? What do you do? How do we solve this problem? Which again, I think is one of the two main things that has really made this uh, issue uh, so uh, such political dynamite, where people are so unwilling to either talk about it in a thoughtful way or all too happy to demagogue it? Well, I think you start from the perspective, uh, firstly, that we're dealing with people. Um, uh, and too often times in this debate, we forget about that. We're right. dealing with people. And these are people who, uh, although they may have not come over to the United States uh, through the legal, usual way, they have built a life here. Right. They often have sons and daughters and spouses who are American citizens. Um, we can craft a law that recognizes that we're dealing with people whose lives have been contributing to the forward progress of the United States and still also uh, ensure that they have to earn citizenship. Um, because I do agree, and I think the governor mentioned earlier, uh, in addition to border security, that, and I hear it all the time, you know, that it rubs people the wrong way, that folks would have entered the country illegally and now you're letting them stay here. They say, well, why don't you have them go back to their country and then we'll talk about them uh, becoming citizens one day. Uh, I just believe that that's not realistic, it's not practical, and that you can both give them the opportunity but also have them shoulder responsibility for that opportunity to become a citizen. Governor Barber, do you agree with that? I do. Look, there, we're talking about 11 million people, millions of whom have been here for years right. and years and years. Uh, and and the, the average time of stay is lengthening all the time. Yeah. I mean, you got people in Yazoo City, Mississippi, which is a little town where I live, who have been in our community 20, 25 years. You got people who've got children here, a right. very large number of these 11 million people, children. Uh, some of them are, uh, as some of these families, when you were mentioning uh, uh, perspectives, a lot of the f children are citizens. They're, they're not, you're not just talking about dreamers who've been here, brought here by their parents through, quote, no fault of their own. But you got a lot of these people are actually citizens of the United States. They were born here. Absolutely. Families. And anybody thinks we're going to send 11 million people back to where they came from, well, if they tell you that, they'll lie to you about other things. I mean, <laughs> that ain't going to happen. I mean, that's just simply, that's not going to happen. And it shouldn't happen. There are three, four, five million of these people that have had the same job for years or decades, and about the stupidest thing we could do economically is make them leave. Right. We don't have anybody to replace them with. Uh, so uh, the impracticality of sending everybody home should be obvious to everybody. So what are our other choices? Okay, our other choices are come up with a system that doesn't offend the, the laws of the country, that is, make somebody admit they broke the law, that they deserve to pay a fine and they do, do put, maybe put them on probation for a period of time, and then let them have a chance to live a regular life and be a productive citizen of our country. And then finally, economically, we help ourselves so much by doing that and in the process, we stop, end, put an end to the failed system that we have now. If, if I didn't know anything else, I know that anything is better than what we got. What we got is a rank failure. It is just a terrible, it's, it's against everybody's interest. So there are three good reasons right. that you right. can do this in a responsible way. The requirements ought to be rigorous. Right. And I think the people who are advocates of, of immigration reform recognize 
that the requirements ought to be rigorous. But the, the people that have come here, we need them to stay. Right, right, right. Do you feel that on, on Capitol Hill right now, that those people who are taking a hard line, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, what to do with, with those people who are living in the shadows, how strong is the block as you see it who do believe, say, in mass deportations, or that they do believe that there should be a very kind of strong punitive bent? Is, is that the holdup, or is the holdup elsewhere along the line of this issue? Well, first of all, I would say the people who think we're going to send 11 million people back are few and far between. Okay. It is fewer than say that. Right, right. Uh, I will tell you that. That's not going to happen. But it isn't that many people that even say that. They, they're people whose argument is and what they talk about is we should not reward people for breaking the law. Right. And, but the, the vast majority of Americans, vast majority of Republicans, vast majority of conservatives do not believe in deportation right. of 11 million people. They just, they just don't. Uh, but as I said earlier, cost is an issue that right. people, that has to be confronted. You know, we've talked about breaking the law, we've talked about border security. People have to understand, done right, this is actually good for the American economy and good for the Treasury mm -hmm. of the United States. You hear a lot about that, and then the last thing you hear a lot about is will they enforce the law? Well, mm -hmm. look, you, you can like President Obama, and I like President Obama, that's not the issue. By the time this gets going, he's not even going to be president anymore. So mm -hmm. let's talk about the real issues mm -hmm. that we need to deal with. Because sure. I, I assume the law will be enforced yeah, right, done right. right. Yeah. One of the things that we saw, there are two sort of bits of news over the weekend that I think are worth talking about today as we look forward. One related to the potential candidacy of former Florida Governor Jeb Bush uh, and talking very specifically about immigration. In fact, at the Presidential Library and College Station. Uh, the other was news that came out that ended up on the front page, uh, or I'm sorry, as the lead uh, editorial in the New York Times on Sunday. And that was the fact that the Obama administration is now, uh, has passed, surpassed the mark of two million deportations uh, and, in an effort, I think, to sort of get tough uh, and perhaps to um, ameliorate concerns from the, from the right, the sort of seriousness of that issue. Do you, are, are you comfortable with that, uh, with, with the president that you have worked closely with and are closely identified with, gave a keynote at the Democratic National Convention in 2012. Are, are you comfortable with the level of deportations? Is that something that needs to be done to bring people into the tent? Or is there another way to go about that issue? Oh, I, my hope is that he'll, his administration will go about it in a different way. I'm not comfortable with the, the number of deportations. Um, you know, the New York Times article uh, and other articles have focused on the fact that folks with relatively minor uh, criminal records right. instead of the significant right. criminal records of felonies that have been spoken about in the past have actually been deported in large numbers. Um, traffic and, violations and, yeah, traffic, and things like that, right? Things that I don't think anybody would argue are, are concerns to, the, to the, the safety of a community or national security. So my hope is that just like he did with DACA, that the president will find uh, ways that are within his power mm -hmm. uh, that are constitutional uh, to ease uh, the level of deportations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Governor Barber, let me turn to you to go back to the issue with Governor Bush. Uh, he did write a book recently about immigration, which was a comprehensive look at it, but did not provide a pathway to citizenship. But one of the things that was pulled out of his speech on Sunday was that he was taking a far more moderate view, and in fact, in some ways, had referred to the act of immigration, either legally or illegally, was an act of love, that essentially those people or who are coming to this, this country are doing so primarily in an effort to improve the economic stability of their lives, and by extension, the economic stability of their families. Is that the right message for your party going forward as, as we move into the next presidential election cycle? Or what is the tone that you would like to see from wh whomever the next candidate will be for the Republican Party on the topic of immigration? You know, I thought it was interesting in the 2012 campaign, uh, Rick Perry, and Newt Gingrich right. were very moderate, open, mm -hmm. uh, closer to what I consider my views. Uh, and it was Mitt Romney who was the viewed at the beginning as the least conservative candidate that saw fit to get over to the right of them, right. If, you, if you want to describe it that way. I think it hurt him terribly in the election. Right. 
I mean, I just think it was a, a, a very bad strategic mistake. What people want you to do is tell the truth. I mean, and if Jeb feels that way about it, it sort of reminds me of my old boss, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan used to say, when the Blame America First crowd gets out of hand, then you need to apply the Gates test. I said, well, Mr. President, what, what's the Gates test? He says, the Gates test. Drop all the gates everywhere in the world and see which way people run. <laughs> they run to America. <laughs> right. And right. that's what Jeb is saying to me, that this is the, this is the place for good reason. And we ought to be proud of it mm -hmm. that when you apply the Gates test that people want to come here. And that's what's good about this. And I don't find that that message has the benefit of being true. Right. right. So right. Uh, okay. but whether everybody will take that same tack, I, it's, it's neither here nor there. Sure. But it's very similar to what Ronald Reagan thought. And in, in that sense, that's, is that the right direction for the party? Is that the right well, message I think, I, you look, want to be hearing? I think for economic policy. For, for legal policy, for national security policy, and for immigration policy, as well as being the shining city on the hill, every one of those is a reason we ought to have good immigration reform. That's a fair point. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I think what's going to happen as you get into the 2016 cycle is that uh, you're going to have more Republicans than not that are closer to the Jeb Bush position. Right. Uh, and right. somebody uh, with that view who gets into the general election right. and makes it a more competitive general election against the Democrat. Right. Do, you, so, do you have a particular window? I mean, it, it's interesting that you say that. We, we are around the magazine are sitting around thinking that we're going to have uh, two legitimate contenders for the Republican uh, nomination next time around, which is good for Texas Monthly, uh, be able to write about Senator Ted Cruz and be able to write about Governor Rick Perry as they move forward. It is interesting when you pull that moment out of the, of the campaign in 2012, um, Governor Perry took a lot of heat for his comment that you don't have a heart if you don't support the fact that people who are living here, whether they're from immigrants or not, whether they're here legally or not, if they have been here for a long period of time, should not have access to in-state tuition for our public universities. And in fact, Texas passed that law in 2001. It was one of the very first in the country. California followed quickly behind and then expanded it in, in 05. W was that something that was is well received on, on your end? I mean, again, as you're talking about a civil rights component to this, but you're also talking about an economic component, is that the tone that, that you think is the right one for uh, the party to be striking? Again, I, what I think people want to hear from candidates is what they really think. Okay. And Rick Perry was obviously saying what he really thinks. His record matched what he thought. His, uh, and that's, people ought not to be sticking their finger up in the air to say, now what do people want me to say? Right. You know, be for what you're for right. is, is the best rule of politics. Right. Be for what you're for. And then the second rule is tolerate people who disagree with you. Right. Good people can disagree with me on all sorts of things. Right. But uh, I think to try to pigeonhole what is the magic way to right. talk about immigration, it, you, get, you get people who are becoming contrived and not, not useful. Fair enough, fair enough. We're just down to a few minutes. I'd like to thank both of you for this discussion and for being here today. Uh, Mayor Castro, if you could just solve one problem related to this issue or talk to one person about this issue and have the opportunity to change somebody's mind who maybe disagrees with you, what, what would it be? If, if you were able to break through on one aspect of it, what would you most like that to be? I guess that, that's a broad question and a narrow question. Uh, I would say, uh, to look at the history of our nation mm -hmm. and to understand that we have had these challenges throughout the history of our nation with peoples that have come from different nations throughout the world. And every single time we've been able to surmount those challenges and to welcome those groups in and to become a stronger nation because of it. Mm -hmm. And that it's fully in keeping with our tradition as Americans uh, to welcome new immigrants and to find a way uh, to uh, have their brain power and their energy and their talent make America stronger. And that in this 21st century, where, as the governor mentioned, we're competing for investment, for brain power, uh, for, for uh, economic development on a global basis, uh, we need them 
as much as they need us. I see. Governor Barber, do you have a thought on that? Well, I, I don't think there is a single silver bullet, but I, I, I can't resist talking about one subject we haven't talked about that I think is really important. Today, it was announced that the United States government is going to quit taking applications for H-1B visas. Mm -hmm. These are the visas for the very specially skilled, we only have 65,000 of them, plus another 20,000 for people with more than a bachelor's degree, a, a doctorate or a master's degree. Uh, this, is, this is the science, technology, engineering, math, elite of the world right. who want to come here. They now today they're going to quit taking applications. They started last week. Mm -hmm. The window was open from April the 1st till yesterday. And the 85,000 were more than applied for. Right. Uh, when you have a system that denies these young people, the best and the brightest in the world, to come here, go to school, and then we won't let them stay. So they go home to Mumbai and start a factory that employs 800 people, where if we'd have let them, they'd have gone to Memphis and started a right. factory right. that employs 800 right. people, right. that they would put, but in, in Texas, y'all have, uh, people think about Texas border and all that. I mean, here's, we're in one of the high tech centers of the world in this town where we sit. And they need, as the mayor said, they need this talent here. And it's talent we're denying to ourselves. I would urge all of you to just do a little bit of the research about how many jobs are created by the average person that gets an H-1B visa to come to the United States. In a matter of years, it's multiples. They're like four or six Americans working for every one of those right. immigrants who came here. And yet we don't, we, our government policy is we don't have enough of these visas to, to last a whole right. week right. In, the, uh, in the supply right. chain. Right, right. Excellent last thought. I'm afraid I did run a little bit over, but I'd like to thank you very much, Governor Barber. Thank you, Mayor Castro, thank for you. being here today. Thank you to the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library and for you for being here. Thank you very much. That was excellent, gentlemen. Thank you. Oh, sorry.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Patty Griffin. Hello. I have the honor today of introducing, and Austin, Texas has the honor of hosting, one of the great voices of a generation of generous and committed civil rights activism. To be a great singer all by itself is a tremendous commitment, a combination of artistry and athleticism. The idea behind the work is to communicate what is in the heart through the voice. It's a mysterious form of communication, but one that is rarely questioned in its mysteriousness, particularly when one is lucky enough to hear the singing of a great singer such as the one here today. Music is the universal language, all-inclusive. One only has to be within earshot to participate by listening and feeling its vibrations. A singer, a good one, lets you feel what is in his or her heart. Sometimes that singer allows us glimpses of great depths of understanding we have yet to reach on our own. Perhaps we are too removed from what they are singing about or have even been too frightened to feel it. Singers such as these share their inner wisdom, allowing us to grow our hearts, our compassion, and become better people. And great singers who are committed to understanding, to equality, to fairness, to giving voice to the unheard among us, to nothing less than our future on this earth as humans, and who do so for decades with a commitment surviving all weather these are singers on a whole other level. The singer I have the privilege of introducing today is on this level, and with her body of work and the work of her family has left us with many clues. <clears throat> clues that perhaps point to the true face of a beautiful world and a life well lived. For me personally, there have been many clues, many breadcrumbs on the path, many bits of gold in the sand that I have found through her voice. For, for this, I'm eternally grateful and indebted. Please welcome Mavis Staples. And moderating the panel discussion today on music as a catalyst for social change, he's the executive director of the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles, uh, noted music, American music authority, specifically on music in the 1960s, an author of more than a dozen books, his most recent, This Land is Your Land, Woody Guthrie and the Journey of an American Folk Song, frequent lecturer on American music at the White House and exec executive producer of the concert series in performance at the White House. Please welcome Bob Santelli. Mavis, first of all, thank you for doing this. It's an honor to have you here. And I, I think the last time we actually got a chance to sit like this, we were at the White House talking about soul music and the importance of music in the civil rights movement. Yes, we were. Yeah. And actually, it was around the same time. So it's getting to be a habit. <laughs> <laughs> Next year at this time, I'll look somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> the Staples Singers uh, are generally recognized in music history as one of the seminal groups in American music history, particularly in the post-World War II period. And it was because yourself and your sisters and, and pops, of course, bridge the gap between rhythm and blues, soul music, and gospel music. Yes. And sometime during that transition of moving from the sacred into the secular, of course, you and your family get involved in the civil rights movement. Yes, Talk a little bit about how that happened. You know, back in, uh, actually, we started singing in 1950. And, uh, 1960, well, Pops had started hearing Dr. King on the radio. Dr. King had a radio program, and Pops was hearing uh, his, his program. We happened to be in Montgomery, Alabama on a Sunday morning, and uh, we didn't have to work until that night. So Pops 
called my sisters and I to his room. He said, listen, y'all, this man Martin is here. Martin Luther King. We didn't know Dr. King, Pops. He keeps secrets, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, Martin Luther King, and he has a church here. And uh, I'd like to go to his uh, 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 Sunday morning service. Would you all would like to go? We said, oh yeah, Dad, we want to go. We all got in the car, went down to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. We were seated. Someone let Dr. King know that we were in the service. And he acknowledged us. He said, we're glad to have Pop Staples and his daughters here this morning. And I hope you enjoy the service. Well, we enjoyed the service. Yes. <laughs> when it was over, you know, Dr. King would stand at the door and greet the worshipers as they filed out. My sisters and I, we walked past and we shook Dr. King's hand. And um, when Pops' turn came along, he stood there and talked to him for a while. And he finally came on, we get back to the hotel. He let us go to our room and he went to his room. Then about a half hour later, Pops called us to his room again. He said, listen, you all, I like this man's message. I really like his message. And I think that if he can preach it, we can sing it. Yes, and that was the beginning of our writing of civil rights songs, freedom songs, message songs, and uh, the first one was March Up Freedom's Highway. And uh, then we wrote, Why Am I Treated So Bad? Why Am I Treated So Bad turned out to be Dr. King's favorite. And he would tell Pops, you know, we'd sing before Dr. King would speak. And some nights at the, we'd be going down, all the men are down on the parking lot. Pops, Dr. King would yell out, you're going to sing my song tonight, right, Stape? He called Pops Stape. And Pops said, oh, yeah, doctor, we're going to sing your song. And that was, why am I treated so bad? We'd sing, why am I treated so bad? Pops wrote that song. You know, there were a time when there, the nine black children were trying to board a school bus in Little Rock, Arkansas. They wanted to, to, to attend Central High School. This, this went on for so long, Bob, they wouldn't let the, these children would walk proudly with their books ahead, held high, and uh, they'd walk into a mob, a mob that would spit at them and throw at them and call them names. They never would turn their heads. They'd keep on walking. <laughs> Finally, it's went on for so long, the governor of Arkansas, the mayor of Little Rock, and the president of the United States said, let those children go to school. And we're all in the, on the floor, pops in his recliner. We wanted to see these children board that bus. Man, children get up to the bus. Time they get to the door, a policeman put his billy club across the door. And that's when Pop said, why are they doing that? Why are you treating them so bad? And he wrote that song that evening. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, it's pretty obvious, and I think most historians acknowledge the fact that music really was the fuel of the civil rights movement. If you yes. took away music, it would have been hard to succeed because music gave the marchers, people like yourself, Dr. King, mm -hmm. the courage, yes. you know, the courage and the strength to right. push on despite the obstacles and the hardships. That's right. It's, you grew up in the church, you grew up learning gospel music, and it was pretty easy for gospel music to leave the church and get out on the front lines and get out on to the marching. <laughs> right? Yes, indeed. Explain how that happened. Well, that was, uh, you know, <clears throat> we in the church, we're singing gospel. Gospel is truth. And this civil rights movement was truth. We needed to give our input of what we felt. You know, we were Christian people. And we, 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 we mean business, you know, we, we want it like this. We, you know, we don't mess around, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so once we started singing, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Turn me around, you know, and you put some of that gospel up in them songs, and people are gonna hear that. Yeah. 
People are going to hear music, period. Yeah. You know, people love music. I don't care what kind of music it is, but if you sing it, yes, sir. If you, <laughs> if you, you bring in some truth and, and, and realness, I mean, and you people can actually see this happening, what you're singing about, it's going to move you. It's going to move, it's going to motivate you. And that was what we, we wanted to give people a reason to get up in the morning yeah. and get started. You know, get started on your day. And um, Pops, Pops was our leader. Whatever Pops told us we wanted to do, that's what we were going to do. <laughs> you know, and uh, we loved it anyhow. We loved, I was, I was a teenager. I was the same age as those kids in Little Rock that couldn't uh, board the bus. You know, so I became super interested in, in um, the civil rights movement. When we first started, you know, when we went to Dr. King's church, I didn't know Dr. King, yeah. but I certainly enjoyed that service, and I'll never forget it. And uh, I've just been trying to keep it going, keep it going. If you, every song, every album, CD that I record, I have some civil rights songs there, yeah, freedom right. song. Every concert that I do today, I'm still singing freedom songs. I'm still singing. I'm not going to let it go, because mm -hmm. I'm a witness. I'm a living witness, you know? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Thank you. But uh, it's, it's just a part of me. And um, um, I think the more, you know, I continue to sing these songs. This generation, this generation, the next, these kids, you know, they weren't there when we, I was there, and I'm still here, and I'm bringing it. I'm bringing it to you. I'm, I'm, I'm still on the battlefield, y'all. I'm on the battlefield, and I'm fighting every day. But I'm fighting for love. I'm fighting for hope, and I'm fighting for peace. And I won't stop. I will not yeah. stop. My father and Dr. King, Dr. King, your greatest, like you hear, you hear, uh, what's his name? Muhammad Ali, I'm the greatest of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. King, I'm sorry, Ali. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> nah, you can't be uh, Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King. And you know, I just, I just, Loved uh, to hear Dr. King's laughter. Yeah. You know, he would, he had this jovial laughter. And most times I would look at him, he, he looked so serious. And, and he might look sad, but, but that's, that's what I've held on to, his laughter. Because anytime I heard him, I said, oh, Dr. King is happy. Yeah. Dr. King is happy. But um, yes, uh, it's, it's just, 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 uh, such an honor and such a wonderful feeling to have been able to stand next to this man and to shake his hand, this great, mm. great man, Dr. Martin Luther King. We were talking just backstage and I asked you if you and the Staples Singers were at the March on Washington, of yes. course, and that was one of the ones that you missed. Where were you and what was happening? We were over there happen? in London. Had no business over there. <laughs> 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 we missed we missed the margin margin but that was up we 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 recorded we wrote songs march uh uh um uh it's a long walk to dc but i got my walking shoes on and uh oh, we we would sing you were there in spirit then i was sure. there in spirit right. yeah right. but uh, them folk in in london didn't have nothing for me <laughs> you know they didn't even have no turnip and mustard green <laughs> 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 so, and I know over there that March, them sisters put the pots yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> they put them pots on, and after everybody got through marching, they went to munching. <laughs> <laughs> cornbread, turnip and mustard greens, old corn, the works, corn on the cob. <laughs> well, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Bob, you do this to me every time. <laughs> yes, indeed. But I'm just so grateful that the Lord has kept me, and I'm still here to 
carry on you are. what uh, Dr. King and my father, Pop Staples. Mm -hmm. My sister, Yvonne, is still with me. You know, we, we, we're, we're carrying on. We, yeah. we, we got to keep that legacy of Pop Staples and Dr. Martin Luther King alive. Yeah. But Dr. 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 King is going to be alive. But, yeah. but Pops, we have to work on Pops' yeah. legacy. That's right. We you do. Know, everybody didn't know them Staples singers. That's right. Well, look, but, you, you know, you, speaking of Pops and, and the Staples singers, one of the great things about the group was, you know, you were able to succeed in the church. Yes. And you were able to also succeed, like Sam Cooke, you know, yeah. taking a song that had um, some serious messaging and bring it onto the pop charts. You know, mm -hmm. a song for like Sam Cooke, A Change Is Gonna Come. Mm -hmm. What an amazing song, great oh, song. Lord. And people learned about that, mm -hmm. uh, learned about the message behind it by hearing it on the radio, on the pop charts. Right. And the Staples singers were doing the exact same thing. You had, you had many songs cross over yes. from the, either, either the black charts or gospel and then into the Pop, the yes. uh, pop charts. Mm -hmm. that, was, must, that must have been gratifying for you. And it was gratifying. Too. It was. And, and, and we, it surprised us. You know, we, we never thought we would get this high. You know, we, we were just singing because we loved to sing. We were singing when Pop started us singing. We were singing to, uh, to sing in church. We never thought we'd even be making records or traveling. We weren't, we weren't trying to be uh, um, stars, yeah. you know, we we sing for nothing. You know, we didn't. You didn't have to pay us. To sing. Mm -hmm. We we just loved it. But um, I think that it's the best thing that could happen is for that music to to turn over like that. You know, people they tried to put us out of church. They wanted to put us out of the church yeah. when I'll take you there yeah. came out. That's right. You yeah. know, people would jump up and dance, but to see the church people. That that beat. I know who a place. I couldn't resist that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it, Bob. That's okay. But, but uh, the church folk, they started saying the staple singer singing the devil's music. Yeah. The devil's music. I had to do so many interviews. And I would tell them, first thing, the devil ain't got no music. <laughs> the devil ain't, devil ain't got no music. All music is God's music. And, and uh, you have to listen to what we are saying. We, I'll take you there as talking about taking you to church, taking you to heaven. I know a place. Ain't nobody crying. Ain't nobody worried. Ain't no smiling faces, lying to the races. Mm -hmm. Now, where else could we be taking you That's but right. to heaven? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, you all have to listen to our lyrics. You just hear the song come on, and you hear that beat, and you see everybody jumping up, dancing. You know, we're singing, I'll take you there as a gospel song. That's right. And boy, they started hearing what I was saying. Next thing you know, we were invited back to church. The very first song, Request, I'll Take You There, okay. sang right in the pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the church was rocking. Yeah. I said, see there? You can't help but move. Right. If you got a beat, if you got a beat, and, and that's with any, any music, you know, and especially with gospel, you know, that spirit hits you, you got to move. That's right. You got to get on away from here. You know, so people, they take music and they know it makes them feel good, you know, but they, they wanted to try to say, the stable said, that was music. Daddy said, maybe you do interview, Cleety, you do interview, all of us did interviews. But my main thing was about that devil. Yeah. You know, because I didn't like the way that sounded. Yeah. The staple singers singing devil music. And when the, from the time I was like this, we have been singing church songs. Church songs went to folk songs. Mm -hmm. Folk songs, people, people would hear, our, um, I, I used to ask Pops, I said, Daddy, why are these blues festivals calling us? We don't sing no blues. <laughs> he said, maybe. You go back and you listen. We had such a unique sound. You did. You, see, you, <laughs> you listen to our music. 
And our music has some of everything in it. That's right. And, and Bob, for years, we sang gospel songs with my father. Didn't know Pops was playing the blues on his guitar. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, that's why Muddy yeah. Waters and Howlin' Wolf yeah. like you so much. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> right. Because <laughs> you're playing the same music. That, but Pops mm -hmm. learned from a blues artist down in Dockridge Farm in Mississippi, Charlie Patton. Yeah. Charlie Pops was a, a boy. Charlie Patton was a man. And uh, Howlin' Wolf was there. And uh, he said he would he'd see Charlie Patton playing the guitar. He wanted, when he started, he wanted to play just like Charlie Patton. Mm -hmm. And he was making 10 cents a day. I said, Daddy, you were making 10 cents a day? He said, Mavis, that was a lot of money back then. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So <laughs> down on Dockery's Farm, right out in Drew, Mississippi, yeah. and uh, he, he has showed us since where he purchased that little guitar mm -hmm. at a hardware store. And they let him put his 10 cents. He put it in the layaway until he could get it out and he started teaching himself Charlie Patton style. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Elvis Presley told me one time, oh, Miss Sable, I like the way your father played that guitar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to say, many, when you think of the great blues guitar players, and you have a few in this, in this city as well, but Pops, if you are a true blues musician, a true blues guitar player, Pop Staples goes on your list as one of the great unsung blues players. Right. And the proof is, like you just said, whether it's Elvis Presley or Eric Clapton That's or right. anyone else saying, what a great stylist. He right. was a great stylist. He had a great style that could carry from the blues into gospel, into R&B. Right. So your sound had a consistency to it, and yet you could go anywhere with it. And you did. And he you know, in, in the 60s, too, you also, uh, you know, we talked about being on the front lines and, you know, with Dr. King. Mm -hmm. There were people that you met that were starting to come into the movement who weren't African American, but who understood the cause a gentleman, young man at that time by the name of Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. And you met Bob Dylan and you saw him and Pete Seeger and yes. others who were yes. also on the front lines. Talk about your time with them in the 60s and Oh my months. God. Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, <coughs> one of the world's greatest poets. And uh, we met Dylan back in the early 60s. Yep. And we were in New York about to do a General Electric TV show. Everybody was there, all the folk singers. We didn't know folk music, you know. But when we started hearing this music, well, Bob Dylan's manager said, Bob, I want you to meet the staple singer. Bob said, I know the staple singers. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, Pops, Pops has a smooth, velvety voice. And Mavis, Mavis gets rough sometimes, she gets rough. So he heard my hoop, he heard my squall, you know. And uh, he, he quoted the song. He said, Mavis says, yonder come little David with his rocking sling. I don't want to meet him. He's a dangerous man. <laughs> so he started singing. They started the show. Pops and us, we were standing on the side. Dylan started singing. And Pops said, wait a minute, y'all. Listen to what that kid is saying. And he was saying, how many roads yeah. must a man walk down before you can call him a man? And you see, Pops used to tell us stories about when he was in Mississippi, he was a boy, he couldn't walk on the same side of the street. If a white man was coming towards him, a white person, period, was coming towards him, he was on this side, he had to cross yes. over. So Daddy said, we can sing that song, y'all. Mm -hmm. We can sing it. And, uh, we went home, we got Bob Dylan, we learned blowing in the wind. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, Pops could literally live it, you know, because he, he, it, it was real with him. He would tell us a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. He would tell us, and between Pops and my grandmother, man, those were the best times sitting on the floor listening to stories. But um, Pete Seeger, P.C., if I had a hammer, I had a hammer in. Oh, he was something. He was, he was just genius, yeah. just genius. And it was such an honor to meet a man like Pete Seeger. And uh, we would go, we'd be in, just like we'd be invited to blues festivals, we were invited to 
folk festivals. And we sing in strictly gospel. I didn't understand. I was a young girl. I said, Daddy, these people didn't invite us. We'd go to the folk festival, man, and all of a sudden we'd hear a folk song. I said, well, that's, that's the closest. They're singing something like gospel. They're singing truth. And then you look out and you see all these flower children, you know, with the, with the flower. Oh, man, I just loved it. Newport, <laughs> I would have the best time. Newport this year, Newport, Rhode Island Festival is my birthday party. How about that? Yeah. I was, uh, everybody's invited. <laughs> everybody's invited. Yes, indeed. And um, oh, we're going to have yeah. a time. It's one of the great festivals, right? I it's mean, the when one, you, it's the, one of the, the one. great festivals, the yes. One. You know, um, with the time that we have left, um, one, as we said before, the Staples sen uh, singers often found themselves on the pop charts. Yes. And as did people like Aretha Franklin and we said yes. Sam Cooke. And there was a word, respect. And of yes. course, Otis Redding writes the great song, Respect. Yes. Aretha Franklin sings it. And, and all of a sudden, that, that word takes on new meaning. And the mm -hmm. Staples singer did the exact same thing. Let's talk about respect yourself and oh, how that came about. Respect yourself. Matt Rice wrote that. Matt Rice, same guy that wrote Mustang Sally. Right, yeah. You know? <laughs> and Matt, when he told us, look, we're in the studio in Stacks. And Matt came in and said, Pop, now when you sing it, you gotta say, dee 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 Pop said, Mike, man, I ain't saying that. He said, that's <laughs> not the staple singer. I'm not gonna say it. And Matt said, Pop, you have all the little kids, you have everybody saying, dee 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 dee. We talked Pop's into doing it. And lo and behold, Matt was right. Yeah. Matt Rice. Yeah. And, uh, Respect yourself, you know, Bob, that's my favorite. Yeah. It's still my favorite. Mm -hmm. And I think that today, respect yourself just need to be recorded all over again. Mm -hmm. Because these, some of these children, I won't say all, but some of the children, man, they don't, haven't been taught to respect themselves or to respect your elder. Mm -hmm. You respect your elder. You don't talk back to no grown person. No, if I had to talk back to, whew, I would have been, <laughs> <laughs> I would have been getting up off the floor many times. <laughs> but no, I would love to hear someone record "Respect Yourself" again, and and uh, it'd be explosive like it was back in the '70s, because that we pops one of the Blackstone Rangers told Pops, Pop Staples, I'm glad you and your daughters recorded that song, Respect mm -hmm. Yourself. He said, I was on the bus the other day, and I realized, for hearing that song, I wasn't respecting myself. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a little old lady on the bus, and I let her stand up mm -hmm. while I'm sitting down. And I have thought about that song. He said, let me stand up and let this lady sit down. Mm -hmm. And Pop said, that's what we want to that's happen. It. That's exactly why we yeah, sing that. Yeah. yeah. But uh, <clears throat> in order to respect fellow man, you have to respect you yourself. You gotta respect first, right? yourself. Yeah. Like yeah. I say, if you don't respect yourself, ain't nobody gonna give a good kahoot. <laughs> <laughs> Mavis Staples. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Help me up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, all. Woo. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> all right, I got a new knee. I didn't tell them about my knee. Bye-bye. <laughs> OK. Bye-bye. For my next guest, um, taking a completely different tack because instead of talking about music, we're gonna hear some music first. Graham Nash, Graham Nash, you might remember if you remember the 1960s as a member of the Hollies, one of the great British invasion groups. And then in the late 1960s, he comes to America, in particular to California, falls in love with the weather there, a certain woman, the music, and basically, starts a brand new career as a member of, perhaps, arguably, 
American rock and roll's first supergroup, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And since then, Graham Nash has been involved not just in great music, but also he's been a man of conscience. He's been someone who has written songs and performed songs for the good of the people, for the good of the environment, for so songs that basically commit to a particular message. He's been a friend of the Grammy Museums. He's been a friend of all of yours if you've been following his career. He's a great individual, an incredible musician and songwriter. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Graham Nash. Hey, Bobby, how you been? Okay. Okay. All right? There you go. Okay. Okay. How y'all doing? Yikes. Must be David Crosby's school. I'm very pleased to be here, obviously. Um, I got a phone call in early 1969 from a friend of mine called Hugh Romney. He was a uh, beat poet from New York City who now goes by the name of Wavy Gravy. Uh, one of our heroes. Anyway, he called, he called me and said that, you know, the hippies who had, you know, disrupted the Democratic National Convention in Chicago in late 68 had been arrested, uh, you know, for disruption and uh, needed funds for their defense fund. And, and would me and David and Stephen and Neil, you know, consider going to Chicago? I could go and, and Crosby could go, but Stephen and Neil uh, had made other plans earlier and couldn't go. So I wrote this song for, for actually for Stephen and Neil. And they chained him to a chair Won't you please come to Chicago Just to sing In a land that's known as freedom How can such a thing be fair Won't you please come to Chicago For the help that we could bring We can change the world we are get better politicians sit yourself down there's nothing for you here won't you please come to Chicago for a ride and don't ask Barack to help you he might turn the other ear won't you please come to Chicago or else join the other side We can change the world Rearrange the world Is dying if you believe in justice If you believe in freedom Let a man live his own life Those regulations, who needs them all? be free. I hope the day comes soon. Won't you please come to Chicago, show your face. From the bottom of the ocean to the mountains of the moon. Won't you please come to Chicago, no one else can take your place. We can change the world, yes we can.
Thank you. Thank you. Must be 50 years since I tuned my own guitar. <laughs> Not sure whether you're the same way, but sometimes your life gets changed with a phone call, and here was another one. I got a call from Crosby one day. I was in Los Angeles with Stephen. And David said, book the studio, book the engineer, buy some tape, get the band together, we're coming down. And I said, Crowders, you sound intense, what's going on? He says, well, wait until you hear this song that Neil Young has just written. I said, okay, pretty intense, what's it about? He goes, it's about Kent State. And I, I obviously knew exactly what was going on. And so I booked the studio and they came down the next day. We recorded uh, Ohio probably in about an hour and a half. We did the B-side, which was a song of Stevens called Find the Cost of Freedom. We mixed it. Adam, Ahmet Erdogan, who was our dear friend, who was the uh, CEO and president of Atlantic Records, was in the studio that night. So we gave him the tape and we told him to put it out immediately as a single. And Ahmet said, well, you know that you have a single out already. It's called Teach Your Children and it's going into the top 20 already. And are you sure you want to do this? And to a man, we said, listen, when America starts to kill its own children, we're in deep trouble here. So let's put this out. That single, and we killed our own single of Teach Your Children, but the single of Ohio was out about 12 days later. And some of the original artwork was a copy of the American Constitution with four bullet holes in it. So this is the song that, uh, that Neil wrote. Ten soldiers and Nixon Carney we're finally on our own This summer I hear the drumming For dead in Ohio Gotta get down to it Soldiers are cutting us down Should have been done long ago What if you knew her and Found her dead on the ground how can you run when you know? Na 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 Cutting us down should have been done long ago. What if you knew her and found her dead on the ground? How can you run when you know, no, no, no? Ten soldiers and Nixon coming, we're finally on our own. This summer I hear the drumming for dead in Ohio, for dead in Ohio, for dead in Ohio, for dead in Ohio. Thanks. I'm not usually this depressed. 
But there are many, many problems facing this world, as we all know, and you know, all the stuff you've been hearing about you know, this morning, and we'll hear about for the next few days, are, are just some of the problems. But we must keep hope. We must look at the world through the eyes of our children and our grandchildren. We, we, we must make sure that we make it a better place. It seems to be an overwhelming problem right now with all the stuff that's going on with global warming and the political situation and the wars that are going on throughout the world. But we can make it. We can make it a better place. There's no doubt about it. Here's a song I wrote. Uh, it's called Teach Your Children. You who are on the road must have a code that you can live by and so become yourself because the past is just a goodbye teach your children well Cause their father's hell did slowly go by and feed them on your dreams. The one they pick is the one you know by. Don't you ever ask them why if they told you you would cry. So just look at them and sigh And know they love you And you of tender years You can't know the fears that your elders grew by and so please help them with your youth cause they seek the truth before they can die and teach your parents well cause their children's hell will slowly go by and be them on your dreams the one they pick is the one you know by don't you ever ask them why if they told you you would cry so just look at them and sigh and Thank you, Bobby. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> Graham Nash. Thank you very much. Oh, that was wonderful. That was well, great. It's a little hard yeah. singing rock and roll this early in the morning, but that's all right. <laughs> The songs that you sang, of course, very um, appropriate for what we're talking about, as you said, for the next uh, couple of days. In the 1960s, when you were coming up, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we come across the Atlantic, the Hollies are behind you, you come to America and you begin second phase of a long career. Um, the 60s were really an interesting time because for the very first time, pop music in general as we knew it, was really embracing ideas other than puppy love and teen angst. And all of a sudden, they start to become the songs of conscience, if we will. And these songs basically help define not just a decade, but an entire generation, really help shape things. The question is, and I know this is a hard one to answer, and I often ask this to artists, does an artist such as yourself 
have a responsibility to write those kinds of songs, to make sure that songs are not just about entertainment, although that's a very valid reason for writing one, but that there's also the, um, the need, the responsibility to write songs of consequence, to write songs that have a little bit deeper meaning. What's your take on it? I think one has to realize that we're just a small link in an incredibly long and beautifully strong chain going all the way back, you know, since before the Weavers even, and yeah. before Pete Seeger and, and, and Bob. Um, we're all troubadours going from town to town, letting everybody know that the emperor really doesn't have any clothes on, mm -hmm. you know? And we're trying to pull back the curtain uh, and, and show the wizard behind everything because, my goodness, we know how many curtains there are, we know how many wizards there are and nowadays. I, a responsibility? I think it's a, a responsibility as a human being, not just as a musician. Uh, thank God for music in my life. I have no idea what I'd be if, I, if music hadn't come into my life. Um, so I have to thank my mother and father for encouraging me instead of uh, forcing me to get a real job. Uh, I mean, I, I work harder than anybody I know, but I still don't have a job. You know, it's, like, it, it's, a, it's an unbelievable uh, ex existence, this. Um, do we have a responsibility to do that? Or do you feel that you personally have a responsibility? I have a responsibility to talk about stuff that bothers me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't write for anybody. I don't write for David or Stephen or for Neil. I don't write for anybody but me. Mm -hmm. I have to get my feelings out. I have to... Uh, I have to express myself, uh, and the way that I do that is through art and, mu and music. Um, and like I said, I'm an incredibly lucky person because I would probably be absolutely, without question, have been in an insane asylum for the last 40 odd years mm -hmm. if I didn't have this ability to get my feelings out. Yeah, the outlet. Uh, so I, it's not a responsibility. It, it, it's, a, it's a drive. It's a need to express myself in as many ways as I can. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I wrote my, my share of, you know, Moon, June, Screw Me in the Back of the Car songs. I mean, you know, the Hollies made an incre incredible career out of that, as a matter of fact. Um, but when, when I moved to America and I began to hang out with Crosby and Stephen and Neil and Joni, I, I began to realize that even though I had done a, a, a couple of interesting uh, deeper songs when I was with the Hollies, especially in, in, towards the end there. It wasn't until I came to America that I began to really realize that it was important not to waste people's time because in, in many ways, time and our family and our friends are all that we have mm. that's real. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't want to sit you down and play you a song that's going to waste your time because first of all, I've wasted mine mm -hmm. doing it and I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. My father was dead at 46. I'm now 72 years old. I, uh, I cherish every second uh, that I'm alive. I'm grateful for every second that I'm alive. Uh, I'm incredibly proud to be an American citizen as I have been for the last 30 odd years. I didn't feel that it was right to be hypocritical about this country. And if I was going to sit there and criticize this country and criticize the people that run it and praise the country for its incredible beauty and, and the beauty of its people, I, I, I felt I would be hypocritical if I didn't become a member of this society. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I did many, many years ago. I, I don't know whether any of you know anything about Los Angeles, but there's a very famous hot dog stand <laughs> called Pink's. And I went from the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and with 1,500 other people that were becoming citizens that day. And Stephen said, you're an American citizen now, right? I said, I think so. He says, come on, we're going to Pink's. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I'm not so sure that it's yeah. a responsibility, yeah. but it's something that I can't help yeah, doing. I, I just can't. Do you think in the 1960s where songs of conscience were exploding, we talked to Mavis earlier, um, there were all kinds of artists and bands from Dylan and Donovan to the Rolling Stones, Jefferson Airplane, Phil Oaks, so many of them writing songs that carry deeper meaning other than just simple love songs. Did the music have an effect, in your opinion, on the outcome 
the Vietnam War, in particular, uh, what was happening with the civil rights movement. How much, in your opinion, did the music play in the success or failure of it? The momentum of this country is incredible as a planet. And to move it in any one direction takes an enormous amount of energy. And the movements that you do detect are very, very small. Having said that, I do believe that music can influence people. I think it can entice them to think about things that they may not necessarily think about during their working day. I think that uh, the ideas that music carries forth are the most important thing that we have. Um, I mean, it was, ide it was ideas that brought down the Berlin Wall. It, you know, it, it, it's ideas mm -hmm. that, that had you know, the civil rights uh, uh, brought into existence. Um, it's ideas always. And uh, I, I think that music can, I mean, didn't I write it? Didn't I write We Can Change the World? Mm -hmm. I didn't mean it in a huge thing, but I, I, I meant it in a, sm in a small way. Yeah. But we can. We can change the world with music. I, I, I don't doubt it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had many Vietnam veterans come up to me and say that our music saved their lives. Yeah. You know, they were in the middle of the jungle trying to figure out where, how to stay alive for the next 10 minutes and, and would be playing music. And, and, and in, you know, in the late 60s, they were mainly playing our music. Uh, and, you know, to realize, once you drop a pebble into a pond and the ripples spread out towards the bank, it's when the ripples start to come back to, the, to where you threw the pebble in that is most interesting to me. And to hear Vietnam vets talk to me about how our music affected their lives and kept them alive is incredibly gratifying as a musician. Mm -hmm. As an Englishman looking at what was happening in the 1960s, you would come here with the Hollies. You came here, of course, after you, you leave the Hollies. What were you thinking about the civil rights movement? What was going through your mind as you read about the marches and what was happening in Mississippi and Selma, Montgomery, what was happening in the March on Washington in 63. How did you take it? I've always uh, rooted for the underdog. I've always uh, had a, a sense of what was fair. I think being English is very different than being American from, from this point of view. When I was born, World War II still had several years to go. And it, it was a, a part of your daily truth that you did not know whether your house was going to be there tomorrow. Yeah. You didn't know whether your friends were going to be alive. And I think that when you're brought up in that kind of an environment, you have a very different attitude towards, uh, well, what we're doing in America now with all these preemptive wars. Yeah. I think that, God forbid, had you know, New York or Los Angeles or Chicago or, 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 or Austin been bombed like England and Europe was bombed, you know, uh, and almost bombed out of existence. Uh, I think you, you have a, a different attitude towards, towards war. War is in, insane, and as we all know. Uh, <laughs> there has to be a better way of, of dealing with, with our fellow human beings other than immediately going for, the, for, for your gun. And I, I do realize that in many ways this is a, the Wild West, you know. Um, but to me, people like the NRA and, and the pharmaceutical industry and the tobacco industry and the liquor lobby, I think they're all going to be seen as major criminals within 50 or 100 years. I really believe so. I mean, how can you, how can you with all honesty, uh, make a product like cigarettes that kills about 300,000 people a year and still do it, mm -hmm. knowing full well that what you're making kills 300,000 people a year. Mm -hmm. How do you sleep at night? Really, seriously, I mean, how do the Koch brothers sleep at night? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, one of the things that upsets me greatly about, about this, being able to buy our democracy and you know, in, in many cases, you can buy a congressman or a senator for the price of a decent car, which, which is a terrible thing to say, but there is so much corruption going on in every country in the world, not just here. Yeah. Um, I often wonder, you know, don't the Koch brothers have children? Mm. And w when I say the Koch brothers, I don't just mean those two brothers. I mean their ilk, 
they're one percenters who are trying to, tr trying to buy our democracy. I definitely uh, you know, have views about Citizens United. I think it's one of the worst Supreme Court rulings in history to me. And I think that we should all fight very hard to overcome Citizens United. And th allowing this kind of money into politics is just, uh, is, is, it's awful. Mm. It's, tr it's truly awful that you can buy your democracy. And that's what people like the Koch brothers are doing. But don't they have kids? Don't they have like, bore, you know, parts of their organization that are looking into the future, how much oil is left, how much, you know, how much you know, aluminum is left. Don't they know what's going on? Don't they know what they're doing? Mm -hmm. it's, very, it's very interesting. How do they sleep at night? You, you brought up environment. And you were involved along with David and Stephen and Neil and, and lots of, of your friends. Uh, the No Nukes mu uh, movement in the late 70s, which really had a profound effect in changing young people, or not so much changing, but at least enlightening as to what that could entail. And you continue over the years, we were talking before about you know, your, your interest in the environment and climate, and you live in a, in a great part of America, in, in Hawaii, and where you see the absolute beauty, natural beauty of this country, particularly that state, and you're, you've done things and you continue to do things. Where does that urgency come from and how do you put it into the music? It's been a long time since you started this, nearly 50 years ago. I, I often wonder where I get the energy from to, to, to do all this. Um, and the only thing that I can really say is, is I look at the world through the eyes of my children. And I, have to, I, I personally have to make it better for me. And I have to make it better for my wife, and I have to make the world better for my kids. Uh, my firstborn son, uh, Jackson, a year and a half ago, gave us our first grandchild. Who, and you better watch out for this woman, because she's a kick-ass, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> I know that every grandfather says the same thing, but she's a stunning woman. And my, uh, my second-born son, Will, uh, just in the last month, um, found out that him and his wife, Shannon, are expecting identical twin boys in July. Yeah. So I look at the world through the eyes of the future generation. And I've seen this planet environmentally getting much worse. And I've seen the world getting much worse. The reason why I'm in Hawaii was in the late 60s, I used to live in San Francisco. And I saw a billboard that said, shower with a friend, because we're running out of water. OK, funny, right? You know, yeah, big billboard, funny, that's funny. But when you project as to what was going on, when you saw what was happening to the Columbia River, when you saw what was happening with damming up all our major uh, rivers, when we saw uh, particularly Northern California sending all their water down to this desert called Los Angeles, I began to realize that if I was going to get married and have children, I wanted to live in a place where to a, as much degree as I could manage it, where water would never be a problem. One and a half miles from my house is the wettest spot on Earth. Our average rainfall is 460 inches a year. The record, 690. I don't think water is going to be much of a problem for me, but it is going to be a problem for a lot of people, and very soon. Yeah. I predict that oil, uh, oil is going to be worth far less than water. Yes, the entire world runs on oil, and we're going to have to deal with that problem. Um, and it seems that some many, many bright people are working on solutions for that. But this problem with water is going to really uh, uh, be humongous, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you speak about these issues that particularly young people, your children, grandchildren, my children face. In the 60s, civil rights movement, as we said, <clears throat> Vietnam, the anti-war movement, embraced music as an agent for change, or at the very least, inspiration. And it worked. It galvanized a whole generation of young people to get out on the streets, to pay more attention to what was going on. You would think, in my opinion, that today the issues or in some cases, even far more dangerous than they were in the 1960s. Um, <clears throat> there are still civil rights 
movements to fight gay rights, which was spoken about earlier today, of course, being at the forefront, climate change being what it is. These are things that are, will seriously impact not just our kids, but the entire world. Mm -hmm. Why is it, in your opinion, that there hasn't been a movement among younger musicians to do what you did and what so many of your colleagues did in the 60s, which is to write about it, to use the music, to galvanize the masses, to get them to get the government or to the, our leaders to move on this in a way that brings results. Well, a, couple, a couple of things are going on here. First of all, and I'm sure it, 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 it precedes the Romans, but they were you know, credited with inventing bread and circuses where you give the people a little, little to eat and give them something to watch and we'll be able to control them. And that's exactly what's going on today. I think that the people that own the world's media, you could count on two hands. They don't want protest songs on their airwaves. They don't want it on the radio. They don't want it on the TV. They want you to lie down, be sheep, don't say anything, buy another pair of sneakers, buy another soda, and leave us alone while we rob you. That's what's going on today on a very, very subtle level, and sometimes not so subtle. Um, there are many protest songs still being written. If you go to Neil Young's uh, website, Living With War, you'll see about 3,000 of them. But the people that control the media don't want to hear any of that. It used to be that most of the uh, societal changes came from universities, especially mm -hmm. the Sorbonne in Paris and in Berkeley in Northern California and to London to a certain extent. We have trained our kids to be doing this. Yeah. That's all they do, all day. And it's great for them. But it's not really a part of the real world about what's going on. We have distracted ourselves from the importance of what's really going on. We are much more interested in Justin Bieber's monkey and the size of Kim Kardashian's ass <laughs> than we are in, in, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Iraq. On the surface of things, we don't stand a chance. But I can't believe that. I have to believe that there's hope. I have to believe that, you know, that the, the upcoming generations will see through all this buying of democracy. We'll see through the neocons always going for their gun first. I think the kids today are smart. I think that they will see through all this, and I think that eventually they will find their way of, of, of protesting. Mm -hmm. The way I was brought up it, it, is, is, is to speak my mind through music. Yeah. And that's what I'll continue to do as long as I'm you know, on this side of the grass. <laughs> Let me re-speak myself. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the idea that Crosby, Stills, and Nash, or Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, or just Crosby, Nash, I mean, you've had so many different combinations, but there's always been this musical common denominator of great music, great harmonies, uh, songs that were powerful, that moved us, that entertained us, that made us think a little bit more. You're 72 years old, as you said, um, and clearly you've had a long career. What's next for you? How do you, how do you make sure that you remain relevant today in the kind of music that you perform and the kind of music that you continue to write speaks to not just our generation, but to younger generations as well? I've never planned my life. I've only reacted to what was going on in front of me. Hmm. And my mother and father uh, told me when I was a young child that I was a decent person and that if I followed my heart and my conscience, I, I would be okay. And it, it, it's very true. I mean, we, we have choices, right? You, you know, which way do you choose? Do you choose the one w that makes you feel good, that, that makes everybody around you feel okay, or do you follow this other path of greed and, you know, violence. And we have a choice, and, and I choose the positive side. I've, I've always been, I don't think I've changed as a person since I was born. Yeah. I've always been this person. I've always had a need to shout my mouth off for some reason. <laughs> I've, always, I've always championed the underdog. I've always been for what I thought was most fair, you know, and I will continue to do that. 
I, I, I don't see any other way of, of, of living. Mm -hmm. uh, I have about 25 new songs. Uh, I'm about to try and figure out some time to go into the studio. I, uh, so, and some of the songs are, are, are stretched from, you know, CSN have just been on tour. We finished about a week ago. Uh, and although everybody wants to hear Teach Your Children, they want to hear Guinevere, they want to hear Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, we know that all that, you know, but our audience love us for the fact that they could hear a song that was written that morning. And on this tour, that's exactly what happened. I finished a beautiful love song to my wife uh, at four o'clock in the morning and did it that night. You know, I, I fucked it up a little because it was brand new, you know, so, you know it, no, nothing is perfect, as you can hear from, from me over there at the piano. Um, but, but it stretches from, from that to when David and Stephen and Neil and I were helping to protest the Vietnam War, there was one image that we really truly loved, and that was of the burning monk, mm. the monk yeah, that had special. burned himself to death to protest the war. And it was on the front page of every single newspaper that you could possibly imagine throughout the world, because it was horrendous. A man immolated himself because of what he believed in. What you don't know, in the last year, 128 Tibetan monks have burned themselves to death because of what's going on between the Tibetan people and the Chinese government who are trying to obliterate them, right? You try writing a song about that. Yeah. But it was so important for us to do it that my friend James Raymond, who's our keyboard player in the, in the band, who happens to be David's son, a brilliant writer, James and I wrote a song called Burning for the Buddha. So once again, my emotions are running from a, a deep love for someone I've spent the last 30 odd years in, in my life and had many children with to what's happening today in the, in the news. And it will continue to be that way for me. I wake up in the morning, I take my first breath, I'm glad to be alive and I get on with my day. Mm. And my days are very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you don't believe him, you could read your book because mm. he has written a wonderful I guess you would call it memoir, um, that uh, has an interesting photo on the cover, if I'm not mistaken, it's you with a camera around your neck. Because if there's another thing that you love as much as music, I think is photography. And so talk a little bit as we begin to wind down here, talk a little bit about uh, your love of photography and how that related to music in your life. I was 10 years old. We were a very poor family. My father worked very hard. But at the weekends, when he wasn't working, one of the main joys in his life would be to, he bought a camera from a friend of his at work. And he would take pictures of me and my sister, I only had one sister at that point, uh, at the local zoo. You know, elephants, giraffes, all that kind of stuff. And when I was 10 years old, we lived in a, in a house that was called a two up, two down, which was two small rooms downstairs and two, two small rooms upstairs. But he would take, uh, the blanket off my bed and put it against the window to block out the light. And he would, he would prepare photographs. And I remember this one particular day, I was, I was with him. We'd been to the zoo earlier that day. He, he put this kind of negative thing in this enlarger thing and, and shone it on a piece of blank paper and he put it into this colorless liquid and he said, wait. And I, I'm waiting and I'm waiting you know, in 45 seconds to a 10-year-old is like summer, isn't it? <laughs> but I eventually, this image came floating out of nowhere. I, I had, it was a piece of magic that I, I'll never, ever forget. In my book, Eye to Eye, which is a book I have of my photographs, yeah. the first portrait is a portrait I took of my mother when I was 11. So I've been a photographer longer than I've been a musician. And I've always been a very visual person. Um, and I, you know, I, I just am this insanely lucky man. I can't tell you how lucky I am. Mm. I mean, I'm from the north of England. What the hell am I doing in Austin, Texas, talking <laughs> to you guys, you know? It, it, it's been an insane life, and it shows no sign of stopping. No sign whatsoever. Like I said, 25 new songs. But you know what? That's terrifying to a writer to have 24 finished songs that you've already written inside 
songs aren't done, finished, until they're out on whatever it is. It used to be 78s and 45s and vinyl, and now it's digital. Whatever that format is, songs can't leave my soul until they're out there and that you're listening to them. So right now, you're looking at a very tormented man who has 25 <laughs> songs that are all going, please, please. <laughs> Well, Graham, we hope that uh, we get to hear those songs, and we, uh, we appreciate all the music that you've given us over the years. I'm sure I speak uh, on behalf of the audience here that we've appreciated everything that you and Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and Young, and all your colleagues have given us. It's been a, a wonderful musical trip, and I hope, and we hope, that you continue to write as well. Should I, should I play you my latest song that I wrote at 4 in the morning? Oh. Let me see here. We have to change this. So, uh oh. I'm a very simple man, and I'm I'm totally serious about that. I, I, I'm not a clever musician. I, I hardly know you know anything about the piano or the guitar, but I know what I need to say. Um, and and this, this song is, uh, is for you all. It's, uh, this is the one I finished at 4.30 in the morning and s sang that night. It's called Here For You. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby.